So welcome, good morning. Uh, my name is Lucas Evers. Uh, welcome to this uh, fifth day uh, of the STARTS project uh, and of the STARTS prize. Uh, and we welcome you both on behalf of the European Commission and of all the STARTS partners and the collaborating uh, projects. Um, it's an honor for me to, uh, to moderate you through a very packed day with a lot of presentations. But first, I want to say a few words about the, the STARTS initiative, about its vision, where science, technology, combined with an artistic viewpoint, open valuable perspectives for research and business uh, via a holistic and human-centered, but also eco-centered approach. Uh, STARTS mission supports the collaboration between artists, scientists, and engineers, researchers, to develop creative, inclusive, and sustainable technologies, and focus on people and projects that help address social, environmental, and economic challenges uh, within the European continent and um, further about. So it's an ecosystem of projects, and today we will see uh, many of these projects uh, presented. So the Starts Prize, but also uh, the Lighthouse projects uh, about robotics, uh, about human centeredness in robotics, etc. It's interesting uh, to see that the Starts project uh, was initiated uh, a, a little earlier than the new European Bauhaus but uh, also uh, uh, during the opening of the Ars Electronica Festival yesterday, you uh, may have heard there is a lot of um, uh, conversation going on about schools and universities as such. Um, I think there's an interesting relation between the schooling aspect of uh, the new European Bauhaus and that of the STARTS project, where they can be seen as both schools where the new European Bauhaus may be much more oriented at uh, solutions, where STARTS is more oriented at the experimentation between a large variety of creative um, um, participants, artists, designers, uh, but also uh, other sorts of research. So, um, the day is a packed program with lectures, talks, Panels from the Lighthouse projects like Reframe, Mindspaces, Media Futures, a workshop uh, uh, with a number of successful uh, uh, collaboration frameworks, Better Factory, uh, Voyext, um, which will have uh, a theme about the way robots can be seen as people too. This morning session uh, is dedicated to uh, artists working with data, um, we will start with a conversation that I'm uh, very honored to, to have with uh, the two uh, individuals that uh, form Territorial Agency on transform Oceans and Transformation, uh, uh, one of the Starts Prize winners. Um, and thereafter, there's uh, a larger panel where their project is also uh, introduced into a larger group of uh, sword like projects, uh, which is a panel that will be uh, moderated by Elena Simpler. Um, let's have a look. The, the midday afternoon uh, interventions are about robots are people too. I already mentioned that. Uh, the art and technology architecture panel by Mindspaces and the online Starts Prize 21 exhibition tours with uh, who we have here in the space, Carlos Putellini and Christina Maurer. These are activities that are not so much part of this uh, webcast, but they are happening uh, on site. Um, let me have a look. Uh, the afternoon sessions will uh, also be um, discussions or, or conversations I will have with uh, the other winning Starts Prize project, Remix El Barrio, a conversation with Marion Real and uh, Anastasia. Pistu Fidu of uh, IAC in Barcelona. And thereafter, we have another uh, uh, more detailed um, uh, panel that I will also moderate, the Fabrication Deep Dive, which is also looking at that same uh, project, but also uh, combined with a keynote speech by uh, Micaela Magas of the um, 
Commons industry, the Industry Commons uh, initiative. I will get into that uh, later. There's also uh, a lot of other uh, uh, things that uh, will happen uh, off-site. Um, and um, let me look at this. Uh, there's an, an, a panel about the intersection between uh, art and industry uh, in the frame of the, the uh, Better Factory program, moderated uh, and hosted by Rodolfo Grunewald van Vliet and uh, Ali Mohammed of this uh, uh, project. And if you are on site, you can still look whether you can use your swap card to join that panel. Um, also, one more panel uh, in the afternoon is Made in Your City, a new value chain for fashion curated by uh, the Refreen uh, project, which is moderated by Christiane Beer. So, um, in order not to talk too much, because I'm not the interesting part of this day, uh, that is the, the project that uh, we are uh, bringing to the stage here. I would like to, uh, to go to uh, the first conversation uh, I have with um, Territorial Agency, uh, one of the two this year's Starts Prize winners, which is represented by um, uh, John uh, Palmesino and Anne-Sophie Ronskog, who both um, uh, work from London, but currently are in Helsinki. Um, and it's a great honor to, to talk to them, because I think it's a, it's a fantastic winning project. So we will dive in their, into their project, uh, Oceans in Transformation, um, which is a large-scale artistic project that addresses the challenges linked to multi-scalar, multi-temporal, and dynamic environmental data and investigates the impact of human activities on our oceans through data visualizations, exhibitions, workshops, and capacity building programs. Now, briefly, something about uh, the two makers, the two initiators of uh, Territorial Agency. They are an, a London-based independent organization that combines contemporary architecture, science, art, advocacy, and action based on comprehensive spatial analysis, and the formation of new settings for public diplomacy. And that's a very interesting thing there, this public dip diplomacy. Recent projects include Oceans in Transformation, commissioned by uh, the uh, Thyssen Bormisa Academy 21. I don't know whether I really explain or, or pronounce that, that name right. Uh, you can find it on site. I think TBA21 uh, in itself is a very interesting initiative. In collaboration with ZKM, Critical Zones, and the Taipei Biennial uh, of uh, 2020. Museum uh, of Oil with Greenpeace is another project of them. Um, and there's many more. Um, I think they are here. Um, I think um, it is interesting to have an audience here, but there is also an audience online. Um, and I would uh, love to encourage the audience online um, to also uh, ask questions because I can get them here. Um, what I want to do um, with uh, the two artists is actually um, um, ask a number of opening questions which are about their making process, because I think it's very interesting the way they bring a lot of different types of data sets together, and I'm interested in that. But um, I also want to uh, encourage all of you here, but also the people online, to come up with questions about the work itself, what you're interested in, and the, the making process of it. So welcome. Um, it's, it's a little bit strange for me because I'm looking at the screen there, uh, and I know then I'm looking you into the eyes, but I can also see you from the, from the side. Um, let me, let me uh, uh, first once more say how great I think this project is. It reminded me of um, uh, a book of Isabel Stengers in Catastrophic Times, where she's also looking at this uh, global scale of human influence on um, the globe, on Gaia, as she, she knows it, uh, as she calls it. 
But it also reminds me of um, uh, a book by Stanislav Lem that was made into a film by Andre Tarkovsky, Solaris, where it's also about an ocean that is a, a mirror of our soul. Um, I want to go into that later. What I first want to ask you is, um, how did you start to be interested in this type of data? And how did you go about bringing all those data sets together that forms all these images that gives us new perspectives on the oceans and humanity's influence on them? really important for you know, the entire team of collaborators for, of course, Territorial Agency and uh, our uh, commissioner, uh, TBA21 Academy. The beginning of the work really goes back um, uh, many, many years when uh, we were working as uh, architects in understanding uh, the dimensions of what we used to call the city. Uh, we used to have in architecture this idea that uh, we would uh, dominate uh, the uh, human environment by construction and uh, organization of uh, uh, flows and, and both material and uh, information and social relations by constructing a fixed framework. That image of the city, of what uh, even of citizenship, is completely outdated. It's an image maybe that uh, relies much on the 19th century notion of uh, a compact uh, built environment surrounded by what we used to call nature. Today the city is much more expanded. Uh, it is no longer uh, a conglomeration. It's uh, extending across uh, vast territories. When we were uh, starting uh, to understand this, we understand also that when started understanding that the conditions uh, that we uh, operate in rely so much on available information. And there used to be a moment when planning uh, was in the hands of government, governments that had major information systems to collect information and uh, mainly statistical information and geographical information to then act on the system. Today, that dimension is so vast that the magnitude of it is comparable to other components of the earth. So when we started thinking together with uh, Francesca Fontis and, and uh, Marcus Raymond of uh, TBA21 uh, about a project uh, on the oceans, the question was for us, how do we start uh, even getting hold of uh, the information? Who, what are the institutions that uh, hold information about the ocean? Well, usually we all have atlases with uh, uh, a blue uh, splotch of color where the uh, seas are. And, and if you're lucky, we have some bathymetry uh, in it. Uh, so we wanted to understand who holds the information. And the research that spanned many years was mainly dominated by what we call stock taking. Who is in uh, uh, possession of the information of the ocean? And what came about was uh, with an image that is uh, fractured. It's a multiplicity. There's a multiplicity. We all know that there's one global ocean, that the oceans are all connected and there's one global circulation. But what we started seeing is that even though we know so little about the oceans, what we know is so fragmented. And so there is organizations that are uh, local, uh, national, uh, sometimes uh, even the uh, international organizations uh, have limited uh, availability of information. But that information is so sectorial, it's so partial, and uh, so difficult to uh, get hold of. And basically, you need a PhD in every single sector in order to start understanding what is happening. So we made a very simple decision, and we started thinking that what we needed to produce was an image, a spatial then a, uh, image, that would um, drive a focus of the different knowledges that are uh, now trying to uh, have a glimpse of the beauty and the complexity of the ocean. So we started, uh, made a decision that uh, early on that needed to, we needed to deal with uh, data that was available globally, not local, but global data. And uh, that limited uh, the uh, spaces we operate mm -hmm. in. Oh. Sorry, we uh, went uh, with the screen offline. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, we can still yeah. hear you very well. Very well. 
could you could you tell us uh, um, something about the different types of data um, that you uh, are currently working with, and also something about the difficulties or sometimes ease with which you can get access to those types of data. Are you still it there? This is a uh, very interesting uh, question. Um, it is uh, mainly data that is uh, scientific, uh, scientifically uh, originating data. That means data that comes uh, from researches uh, in uh, climate change in the circulation of the oceans, uh, of marine life, uh, of uh, biology. Uh, but of course, a lot of the uh, elements that we are dealing with uh, tend to be images that are, uh, oh, data that is uh, also connected to ex extraction practices, uh, uh, practices that are uh, linked to um, the conditions of uh, uh, exploitation of the oceans. And this is really the uh, difficulty uh, in dealing with um, uh, ocean data that is those who produce the data are so close to uh, those who exploit the ocean. Yeah. So when we deal with uh, satellite data uh, or uh, airborne data at the level of the uh, waves with buoys or underwater data uh, with sonar or um, soundings of the bottom of the sea and the entire water column. We deal with so many uh, institutions that are there uh, trying to know more about the ocean. Some of them for good purposes, but mainly driven by possibility of getting more out of the ocean. So yeah. this is a, uh, what we started doing is really getting data uh, from uh, all the scientific programs uh, that have satellites, basically, and then all the scientific programs that have buoys, all the scientific programs that have uh, put online and shared bathymetric data, environmental data. And each one of the images that we produce is uh, sourced by more than hundreds of um, research centers, and uh, it's really been, uh, say, yeah, could a you... real puzzle to start putting together all of this. <clears throat> Again, I want to encourage anyone in the audience, if you have questions, please, um, we have Carla here in the audience who can guide you asking them. Um, I have another question about this idea of uh, public advocacy in relation to the types of data you are trying to get. Eh? You are also trying to address um, this, um, this notion of the ocean being um, uh, a matter of care, something that needs to be um, put into the public because there is something at stake there. There is biodiversity decline, there is pollution, there is um, uh, territorial conflict. Um, what is your strategy there and would you also include um, an approach of, let's say, citizen obser ob observation of the oceans more than it is now? Well, there was one very um, first thing that we noticed when we started collecting the ocean data, and that was coming from architecture, we were very used to uh, dealing with data that was fixed to a location and land-based. And when we came into the, the ocean data, this was a completely dynamic system. And we very quickly noticed that we need to deal with this data, not as a division between the ocean and the land. So very much of our work was to kind of try to integrate this data and show it as such, as a very first political statement that we can no longer uh, consider the ocean um, separate from the land. The uh, idea of public diplomacy uh, is really got to do with uh, that moment of uh, uh, uncertainty that one has when starting uh, a uh, discussion and a debate with others, where you understand that you, where you would like a condition to go, and, but you don't know how the others would like it. Uh, and so there has to be a moment of uh, uh, engaging with uh, the other knowledges that uh, is not prescribed, that is not scripted in advance, that there's no initial knowledge of power that tells us how to engage with it. And so the entire project is really to set up um, a uh, condition that is uh, 
almost horizontal, uh, open uh, for many participants to come in. And so what we've done in the project was not only to gather the information, but to actually show it back to the uh, ones who have produced that information in a new format in settings that will bring in other researchers. So you will have uh, marine biologists discussing uh, law, the law of the sea together with uh, international lawyers, together with uh, local fishermen, but also indigenous communities in uh, settings that were quite messy, uh, quite unstructured from the outset. But suddenly uh, people started giving up their expertise hat and the dealing really with uh, the growing preoccupation about the ocean. The ocean has been modified so much by, uh, let's put it in a straightforward way, by us extracting fossil fuels and burning them. Uh, the detritus, uh, the debris uh, of that uh, fossil fuel burning is both, of course, in the carbon dioxide in the sky, but it also is absorbed in the uh, ocean. Uh, it acidifies the oceans, it heats them up. The circulations of the ocean have been modified. The oceans are starting to swell and, to, and the horizon is basically going up in a very frightening uh, acceleration. And uh, if we are all good boys and girls, and we do manage to meet the Paris Agreement of, um, let's say, even the uh, two degrees, uh, not the uh, real target of one and a half degrees, we might have enough locked in energy in the greenhouse to make the oceans grow well beyond the one meter, one meter and a half that is predicted at, by the end of the century. But really go to air and cover areas well beyond uh, four to six meters that if we are lucky and we don't even consider the melting of uh, Greenland and Antarctica and uh, the third pole of the uh, Himalayas, uh, we will cover in water areas that are now inhabited one by one billion people. And what we just saw in New York with the uh, aftermath of a tropical storm in the uh, Gulf is nothing else than a glimpse of what sea level rise is doing to the ocean. So it's really difficult to understand notions of citizenship and owning data and being able to act on data when we consider that all our institutions are landlocked, are land-based. We have land-based states, we have land-based uh, notions of citizenship, and we basically are proposing uh, to start operating where in a condition where the horizon is not just us on land looking at sea, but we start being within a complex dynamic. This is the real challenge uh, that we are facing at the moment with thinking the ocean. Yeah, <clears throat> coming back to this, this question of um, per the participation of others, I would be interested, you are um, a team of two. Uh, and you may know the Feral Atlas project of Anat Singh and all the people that collaborate there, which brings together so much uh, information. Could you, um, could you imagine um, expanding your work, working with um, uh, citizen participants that also bring you data, data about um, smaller events you may not have direct access to uh, that deal or that that significantly show climate change and uh, like the, the the floods we have uh, had in europe uh, recently but also the new york events uh, etc because i think if you map that all those smaller events uh, you will also clearly get a dynamic picture of the pace with which this change is happening I think it's really uh, so important that uh, each one of us uh, is uh, starting to narrate and tell stories to others about uh, how climate is changing, how they are relating to the new earth that we discovered. You, know, you mentioned Isabel Stengers and, of course, uh, James Lovelock's uh, Gaia. Uh, Gaia is not that blue marble that we are all used to uh, imagine when we uh, talk about um, the uh, ecological uh, rise. You know, that is an, an still a, an idea that we you look at it from the outside. Uh, the, all, the entire discussion is to start imagining new ways of 
collaborating and being together f within Gaia, within uh, Earth, the only living planet that we know of. And uh, to understand that even uh, the multiplicity of uh, planning and uh, initiatives that every uh, living entity is doing is contributing to the multiple uh, dynamics of the ocean, of the planet. And the oceans are the most sensitive component of it. They record, they are a registering machine. They record and uh, sense their sensorium of all the activities of life. And now there's one species that is starting to use much more energy than every other species in, uh, on the planet. So uh, we are now in a situation where humans are using as much energy as all of the rest of biomass. And this is modifying deeply in the entire dynamics of the Earth. And the only way that we can uh, start uh, thinking this is really through collaborations, through a multiplicity of collaborations, both between individuals, groups, institutions. Uh, we we'll hear many times that this is a structural issue, but we need to uh, take that notion seriously and start thinking, how do we collaborate in thinking what we still conceive as the body politic, as a unified condition and think it no longer as a unified but as a networked uh, relation and that i think where information technology and data technology uh, is going to play a major role but we need to have at the center of that the understanding that it needs to be transformative for citizenship uh, it needs to transform the very notions of what it means to have uh, common institutions how do we make things in common and that is the drive and the project has collaborated with hundreds of scientists, with hundreds of um, uh, artists and uh, local communities. And we tried really hard to understand, of course, we have uh, our team with uh, the researchers and then TBA. But the question is, how do we uh, establish a condition where other voices have equal uh, power than the major voices uh, that are currently debating the oceans. We still are in a situation where we know much less about the ocean than we know about Mars. And uh, that new knowledge that we need to expand into the ocean cannot be held only by the large corporations that are exploiting the oceans. It needs to be horizontally distributed and citizen needs to be uh, engaging with it. And we need to democratize uh, information about the ocean. Yeah. Um, again, any questions of the audience? I have a follow-up question about this democratization process. Um, you are uh, architect. Uh, you, are, um, uh, you, you are based in research, in uh, multidisciplinary research. Um, I think your artistic attitude most probably enables you to bring so many different perspectives together uh, that normally would be bound to disciplinary rules. You can cross those barriers, bringing that together. Um, so so there, there, there is the, the, the artistic aspect of the work, uh, yet at the same time, uh, we're also discussing a lot of the... the political um, elements that um, are also pushing you or motivating you to do this work. Um, is your project um, a research as such, or are you also uh, related to that idea of uh, public diplomacy, going at governments, going at the European Commission, um, going at um, um, other um, governments worldwide to, um, yeah, to strengthen the message that something needs to be done here. Well, territorial agency really would <clears throat> like to offer this idea of using remote sensing, this data, and putting them together in multiple images and overlays, which Oceans in Transformation is doing in order to gather and see those new possibilities. I think that's really the, the, the first step for us to gather around these images and in a new, um, sometimes off-putting for the audience 
or difficult images to, to view. And that's the first step to start these discussions. When uh, we presented the, the project at the uh, event organized and uh, initiated by the commission uh, in what well, called the All Atlantic uh, gathering, where for the first time all the countries uh, around the Atlantic gathered together to start discussing uh, the preoccupation about the transformation of the Atlantic. What was really apparent was that the conditions through which politics usually operates exclude images. They exclude information. They exc no, it's all uh, uh, about distilling everything to a policy that means uh, text-based uh, uh, decision-making. And uh, this is uh, how uh, the modern state has operated, dominated largely by lawyers. And uh, I think that the uh, arts have been uh, relegated on many levels in popular culture to decoration. On the contrary, the uh, images that we produce, and it's, they're not really particularly interesting images, just uh, a lot of data uh, put together. What they do is that they gather. They gather people around them, and they operate in a completely different uh, aesthetic regime. Uh, and I think that is uh, something that uh, could be really interesting to start understanding, especially in Europe, a, co uh, a continent which is a series of peninsula stretching into the oceans, that has engaged so much in painting. You know, Europe is a culture of painting and music and uh, uh, singing and talking, not only writing and uh, literature. And we need to uh, understand better uh, what is the power of this uh, uh, organizations that we have, also with the burden of knowing very well that all the mess that we are describing, and it's a gigantic mess, uh, the disruptive times of uh, Gaia are originating at the same time from that very same culture. And this is really the difficulty, you know? How is Europe uh, operating uh, in a world where we have the burden of having unleashed all of this, and at the same time, having still the capacity and the preoccupations of engaging with it in what we hope an innovative and open way. So this is really, we're at the cusp, I think, where technology can start reflecting back on the Earth system and engaging with the Earth system, not only uh, in retrospect, looking at what we've done, but hopefully looking forward and being able to proactively act. We have a question of the, uh, from someone in the audience. Um, oh yeah. So there's a microphone coming. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, am I? Yeah. yeah. So I guess the question is very simple and, and then probably not that simple, but I'll keep it short. Um, how, how do we deal uh, with the complexity of things out there as compared with, let's say, uh, former reductionist thinking in science. So the, the, what role would the arts have uh, in times when I'd say even science acknowledges that we need to open up to the actual overwhelming complexity of things? How can we analyze this? How can we make this graspable? How can we make it readable? Um, because a, a bunch of data is not really helping with understanding things like that is nothing unless it's knowledge i i've been reading a little beautiful text by erwin schrodinger what is life and uh, in an astonishing way the text opens by him saying and stating that it's obvious that a scientist is required to have first-hand knowledge and experience of the elements that they are describing. And this is at odds and puts a, uh, what he calls a queer question uh, to the contemporary formation of uh, knowledge because uh, the very institutions that are there to form knowledge are called uh, universities. And they are uh, organized around the idea of the universal. Uh, that means a possibility of comprehensive knowledge. And it's quite obvious that you cannot have comprehensive knowledge and at the same hand, at the same time have first-hand knowledge. 
uh, if you would uh, engage your entire career uh, in creating the comprehensive life, you will only deal with secondhand information. And so this is really uh, the difficulty uh, of uh, the institutions that we rely on, but it's also, uh, we think, the major possibility that the new technology offers. Because rather than thinking the university, what we need to start thinking is the multiplicity of knowledges, that each one has a first-hand information, each one has a first-hand capacity, and each is incredibly intelligent. So the question is, how do we use the intelligence of individuals, groups, institutions, and start making them talk to each other rather than integrating them? So uh, I think art, uh, in that sense, in particular the art space, has become one of the few spaces that allows still that discussion to happen across intelligences. It's not about really the artifact, but it's about what the art makes, what it produces, what it moves. And I think art needs to be thought again as the moment where intelligence goes from one individual to the other, where individual apprehension and comprehension of a phenomena can start discussing with a similar intelligence of the others. Um, otherwise, we end up, again, dreaming of universities and universalism with all the drawbacks and uh, difficulties there. Yeah, I hope this is a, a satisfying answer, but I think the, the actionable context within which the arts can do something uh, is, is, is adding to, to your question there. Um, we have another question from the audience, yet at the same time we're really at the end of this session. Uh, I think um, our two speakers uh, of territorial agency are approachable through email. If it's a very pressing question, it's really unfortunate that we don't have you here to go to a bar to have a coffee uh, and have an, an after conversation. Um, yeah. The work uh, of um, the, 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 uh, the oceans in flux uh, of territorial agency uh, can be seen here close by in one of the uh, starts exhibitions. Um, I want to thank you once more uh, for being with us uh, all the way from Helsinki. Uh, I think it's very interesting that we have this, this combination of online and uh, uh, on-site presentations. Um, I hope to be speaking to you uh, in the future. Um, and um, yeah, we are going to the next panel. Uh, the next panel is uh, again with you. Uh, so uh, if the person in the audience will be uh, staying, it's a longer panel where uh, we have a number of other um, artistic and creative uh, um, um, collectives presenting, so that's geocinema, that's uh, tactical tech, um, and again, territorial agency. That will start at 11 and will be moderated by uh, Mar Santamaria, uh, who's, a, um, who's co-founder of the 300 kilometers per second urban planning agency that explores the potentials of big data and new computing paradigms uh, to improve urban analysis. Um, I think she was uh, part of the Start's winning project in 2019. So uh, please stay tuned uh, or be back at uh, 11 o'clock here in the same space where we again uh, have the, the presence of um, territorial agency. For now, I thank you and uh, we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marcus Ryman. I'm the director of TBA21 Academy and its home, Ocean Space. Ocean Space is a new center in Venice, catalyzing ocean literacy, research, and advocacy through the lens of art. It's a collaborative platform that brings together artists and scientists, architects and activists and researchers to together foster 
ocean imagination and ocean action. And as we're in Venice, we chose for the second exhibition of, uh, of Ocean Space, we chose to work with an architecture collective called Territorial Agency and present their work Oceans in Transformation, which is the culmination of a three-year long-term research commission that started with the investigation of sea level rise. And what better place to investigate sea level rise than in Venice? So I invite you now to follow me into the exhibition and uh, see the work. The Territorial Agency has been investigating the Anthropocene, the age of the transformation of the planet, for about the past decade or more, trying to contribute to the amount of knowledge produced by various scholars about this particular age and the transformations it brings about. Oceans in Transformation is an attempt to unravel the mechanisms of transformations on the planet from an oceanic point of view, meaning looking at the Anthropocene from the oceans. So the question they are posing initially is, how can we sense, how can we make understand it, the transformations of the oceanic, whereas the ocean is an area that is invisible, that doesn't allow, doesn't afford us a view into its body, if you want. So what instruments, what possibilities of knowing do we have in order to develop an image of the oceans and its transformation, one. And secondly, how can we bring together the various ways of knowing, the ver various sciences, investigations, data collected on the ocean so that they form a body of knowledge and are syncretized yeah, as one coherent story of the ocean. And in order to do that, they have both developed an aesthetic representation. These are the fields of images and okay. compositions you that you see behind me, but also do a conceptual repertoire that is very important for us maybe? to understand because it is the so ideas, the understanding, the ways of knowing that perhaps also lead us to a better to safeguarding of the ocean. You can in go our first. Future. <laughs> The project of GeoCinema started from our interest in the unobvious images of the Earth. The ones that do not hold a place in the human system of representation and interpretation. When we say the image of the Earth, what do you think of? The blue sphere floating in space, likely. What if we say that this is not how the planet looks?
This is one image of the earth. A patch of land in Tinga Tingana, Australia. It is not only seen by a camera in a satellite. There are multiple sensors that translate various chemical and mechanical stimuli coming from air, light, reflectance of the ground in real time. And while processing that information, trigger specific corrective responses towards the best scenario for image acquisition. This process is called calibration. When calibrated properly, raw satellite image contain data that can be algorithmically extracted, processed and analyzed for quantities and qualities of the Earth's crust. So the Earth is not just seen, it is not a passive backdrop that is being captured. The land, the air, the light are co-composing the image by feeding into intelligent algorithmic imaging apparatus. The land is formed by framing. One more image of the Earth. This is a mathematical modeling of the Earth and its climate. You can see on the screen how Earth observation data gathered since 1970 is being processed to simulate weather in far and distant futures. On a satellite footage, you can see that the surface of the Earth is being photographed in a fragmentary manner, and then these patches are stitched together into an image of the globe. In fact, satellites never capture holistic images of the Earth. It takes 16 days for a satellite to orbit the Earth and to cover it fully. The Earth is being constantly recorded. We just briefly mentioned aerial imaging, but there is much more to that. The planet is fully wrapped with signals which are mediated technologically, with various sensor-based technologies, personal gadgets, etc. Each have their own parameters of scale and temporality, intervals of signal transmission and transition into a visual form, if ever. There is this massive archive of data that is a constantly recorded version of the Earth. And unlike this familiar blue thing, that looks like a perfectly graspable, comprehensible object, the Earth, in fact, is an assemblage that, as a form of a single image, is ungraspable. Looking at this earlier photo of technicians with the stripes of the Earth footage as seen from the Corona satellite, we were quite fascinated how it resembled the editing rooms in the pre-digital filmmaking era. We stayed with this idea of cinematic montage and then asked rhetorically, what would that mean to further explore the notion of cinema on a planetary scale? The overabundance of recording, archiving, distribution of data and images is overwhelming. The speed of these processes flags up many questions in relation to how we understand time or our cognitive abilities to critically reflect on these processes and their effects. Cinema, despite it feeling like an old-fashioned word, became productive as a prism to think through and to produce work. We directly borrow from this idea of montage, 
when we speak of representation of the Earth as never being holistic. Filmmaking has always been entangled with the new optics and recording methods being developed for the purposes of industry, science and military. In fact, as technology, the moving image came out of scientific laboratories and was mostly used to study movements of the object, be it an animal, a machine, or those who were equated to objects such as women, people with mental illnesses, indigenous populations and others, others. Key is that a moving image is not only something that can capture time and movement, but there is this possibility of power and control inscribed in it from the very moment of its inception. There was another implicit characteristic of a moving image, which is psychological or neurological effects on one's own perception. Cinema refers to a technique of mediation of space and time in a way that is potent of feedback loops between our optical nerves and sensory experiences and moving images. It is already here that we were interested in the agency imminent to this medium. Technological recordings and reproductions of acoustic and optical data have critically changed the state of reality. Media theorist Jutta Hall refers to Kittler when she writes that cinema has the power to define what reality is. It is capable of dictating how we are able to perceive and conceptualize the world. With Geocinema, we wanted to further expand the idea to even a greater scale. A century ago, Zygavertov experimented with fixing his camera on a train so it can be detached from the humans' body and merge with the machine on the level of speed and perspective. He was thinking of it as the Kino eye, an eye of a camera which is in its capacity and agency exceeds that of a human. Since technological advancements in the 21st century, introduction of personalized gadgets, more complex and ubiquitous form of computing, increasing development of surveillance systems, etc., reality has become much more complex too, as well as even more discreet. With the attention to regimes of power and control that are inscribed in the cinematic apparatus at its start, we were interested in its emancipatory potential as well. If a moving image has its agency in igniting forms of perception, we wanted to further explore the possibility of understanding cinema as a collective experience of being entranced within a shared space, even on distributed screens, especially as it moves across scales. Our collaborator, media theorist Yussi Parikka, wrote that imaging and sensor-based techniques that have proliferated over the past few decades are emblematic of alternative sense of visuality, but also the political formulation of issues of territory and futurity. This visuality is less about the images as such, but about the architectures, labor, and infrastructures through which the operations unfold. Crucial here are questions about the ontological and epistemological status of these images, what they are and what they do, and importantly, how can we intervene into these processes on the level of politics and poetics.
The imaging techniques today are operationalized in ways that escape immediate visibility or perceptibility. They are part of larger constellations that include migrating forms of governance, which spread through deterritorialized flows of global markets and have become further obscured by the seemingly invisible and not necessarily territorial regimes of data. This constitutes the new epistemological condition within what is now called the Anthropocene. If the image of the Earth as a single form of knowing is ungraspable, then the question is no longer what is the Earth, but rather how is the Earth? How is it being measured and calculated, datified and packaged, distributed and archived? of the start day. So uh, as we uh, have seen, no, or as we can say, no, uh, today the, the world is totally digitized. No? It, we are experiencing uh, a data revolution. So the aim of today's session is to discuss with three magnificent uh, group of people um, how these new technologies that we have uh, available, how all this data explosion that we are living are going to help us to tackle uh, the, the, the challenge that we that we have today. Um, as I said, uh, I'm Marcia Santa Maria. We were lucky enough to be, uh, I think, the, the, the last pre-pandemic uh, start price and, and, no, and had the chance to, uh, to be to be in Linz. I am really passionate to be uh, here today with all of you with you know, uh, to discuss you know, about data, about technology, about you know, uh, how we can empower and use uh, this new data revolution to make things more transparent and really to tackle uh, these global challenges that we are experiencing. 
So architects, artists, scientists, and this is the core uh, uh, of the START initiative. Uh, all of us, we are working together. We are working with these uh, technologies. By these technologies, I mean geospatial analysis, earth observation, cartography, that can bring really a, a huge understanding on these uh, challenges related to the environment, to the society, but also to, to the individuals uh, ourselves. But sometimes what is happening is that all the insights that we try to provide are not tangible for real uh, world uh, people, no? for the general public, for the public administration, for the one that then meet after to take all these processes, all these prototypes, all these workshops, online platforms, artwork, and uh, vehiculate and, and, no, and make this change uh, possible. So as I said, we have three groups, uh, I would say three reference groups in different uh, fieldwork. Uh, we have uh, John Palmatino and Anne-Sophie Rungstad that they are streaming uh, from Finland. Uh, you already, the ones that you were in the previous session, you already uh, no, uh, meet them and start knowing their great work uh, through Oceans and in Transformation that was no, uh, awarded this year the, the Stars Prize. Um, they are a, an independent organization that are combining architecture, science, art, advocacy, uh, and action. For me, they are the most beautiful data visualizations I've ever seen related to Earth observation with projects such uh, the Museum of Oil no, that was uh, uh, showcased in Chicago, the Anthropocene Observatory, Plan the Planet, the Museum of the Infrastructural Unconscious, and they do this, no? and they will expand later on, I think, a little bit on that, but they collaborate, or like the commissions that they have, they come from Greenpeace, uh, from you know, cultural organizations, so that's for us, no? <laughs> it's meaning uh, a lot uh, uh, on the way they do uh, their practice. Then we have Asia from uh, the Geocinema, that together with Solveig, and you are going to, to forgive me if I'm not doing <laughs> the naming uh, right. Uh, they are a collective that they come from, from the realm uh, of, uh, of, of cinema. So we have architecture, we have uh, cinema, and their practice, uh, it's related with the understanding again, no? and sensing uh, of the earth, but they do it in a, in a really different uh, way, you know, through, through filmmaking. I think that later on, Asia will, will show us uh, one of these beautiful uh, storytellings that they, they create. Um, and then finally, uh, and it will be our, our keynote speaker, we have Marek. Hi, Marek. We had some technical issues on the backstage, so I'm happy that, that you were able to finally connect that together with Stephanie Hanke. Uh, you know, they, they, they have created you know, this collective tactical tech that they are researching on the impact of technology and on society. And here the approach is more related to this idea of individual data no so they have produced for more than 20 years exhibitions artworks films events workshop writings trying to explore this relation between individuals and and technologies so i'm going to give the floor uh, to to mara because uh, it, it it had sense for us to start talking about the relation that we have today the individuals with data and how can we make this tangible for citizens you know, and, for, and for people, empowering them to understand really how this relation uh, is working. So Marek, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will share my screen in a second. I was so excited uh, when you were introducing the other uh, co-panelists and speakers to see their work that uh, I forgot that I'm going to be the first one actually speaking. Um, so I try to be brief as well. You have more time for other people to 
show you uh, what they're working on. I'm going to set my clock so I'm not over time. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Marek and Stephanie who was mentioned, she cannot uh, take part because where she is right now is like five in the morning. So I didn't feel like that would be fair uh, to drag her in front of the screen and uh, uh, present to you. Uh, however, she's going to be present here in spirit and through the work I'm going to, to show. So th I think the interesting thing maybe uh, to tell you at the beginning is uh, what is different between us and the other presenters is that actually we look at the um, data gatekeepers. So we look at the data about those who have the data. We try to figure out things, gather some intelligence about those who are in power of having all of it. And we don't know uh, what they have. Um, all our work is um, evidence-based, is uh, based on quite a difficult process of finding information and data and so on. I'm going to show you two two projects, two small projects in a way, and then talk a little bit about how we then turn one project to many projects, if you like, to be able to engage different kinds of audiences, how we work with partners, how we work with different uh, formats of presenting what we're working on. Um, and I'm kind of trying to mesmerize you now uh, with some visualization of some classification of data we've been looking at. These two projects I'm going to talk about are about um, our relationship, as you said, as individuals, but also as society, with technology through data. The data is the, is the modus operandi on all the ends, uh, if you like, but it's very unequal. So uh, we rarely see the data. However, we will see projects later that show you that there's plenty of data out there. I'm looking at data that is uh, personal data, data about us, data about uh, societies, about uh, behaviors, about locations, uh, about attitudes, and, and so on. So the first project and the visualization you see that we started with was looking at uh, the position, the power, uh, the role of company that is called Google and became Alphabet, but it's still Google in a way. And um, what we can figure out, what we can actually tell uh, from what we can see from our point of view, we have very little access to information of, uh, on what they do. Um, so we decided to focus on uh, Google acquisitions and investments to see what the company since 1998 was interested in. And after you know, collecting the data, hundreds of data points, we, we realized that this data is not necessarily uh, full. We only know what they want us or what they don't want, uh, want us to know uh, because nothing is really disclosed. There are no places where you can go and check uh, details about the acquisitions, why they happen, what exactly was bought is not necessarily uh, only the know-how. It can be code, it can be... Uh, basically outbuying competition. It can be many different kinds of reasons, but you never find this information. And also it's extremely hard to find information about the scale. So how much money actually change hands and so on. For us, there was a kind of an initial idea of looking at if this company is in some, some sort of data business, what is this business about? What are they trying to acquire? Uh, where, where they want to dominate the, the spaces? What are the niches they, they're operating and so on? So we created this visualization you see called Google Empire that is made out of nails and threads and uh, embeds uh, Eric Schmidt famous quote, which is a kind of a addition to the visualization. This is not what came out of the visualization. And that wasn't a scientific method. It's a kind of a provocation, if you like, that we often do. And, and that resonates a lot. It's color coded. You can see sectors. You can see the scale, the size of the bubble, which is how much money they spend on, on given acquisition and investment and so on. And that, that was the kind of the opening that made us think we, we actually want to show more through this data. Um, the next iteration of this work uh, changed the name from Google Empire into Google and you because we thought actually this is very important. Um, Google is omnipresent, is dominating our experience of the digital uh, through different means. And we embedded this data in the circle uh, at the bottom of this uh, piece 
where you can move the dial and see which companies and businesses and services you know of that Google owns. And there are hundreds of them. And the stack of the plates represents 10 most mostly used uh, services like Maps, like Android, that have uh, above 4 billion users and so on, etc. And that was another step of trying to figure out how to show, show this kind of, how to engage the audience with problem called Google. And this is the last version of this uh, kind of a data set. Uh, and we focus on actually showing that is uh, not visible. So on one hand, you have the mobile phone that has a mirror a surface and uh, there's a printout of 10 businesses that have more than two, three, four billion users uh, that are accessing them on a regular basis. And then there's this thing in between which is representing uh, actually the numbers, the data uh, of how many users per service, etc., that sits over the acquisitions and investments. And what you don't see here is the Google Eye on the other side, which we presented what this data actually means, so how this data we produce through our engagement, through our attention, uh, is being seen from the Google side. So what can they learn? And not necessarily about me, Marek, on the other side of on the mobile phone, but about all of the Mareks of different kinds in different places who are extremely empowered and dependent on, on this device. So I wanted to share with you the story of how we go about the object um, because um, as I said, uh, we try to present the data in such a way, the data that often is uh, broken, uh, that is not full, that is dirty, that is um, um, having a lot of gaps and missing uh, bits and so on, in such a way that still tells the story because the negative side, the lack of information is part of the story, uh, if you like. So we try to do it in such a way that is interesting, intriguing, that creates a model that helps them to visualize uh, the problem in the mind of the visitor, the audience, rather than us kind of making this comprehensive uh, model in front of them, which is in a way what is happening uh, as well. So that's kind of a, a way of us to enter the space that sometimes is, a, is like you can see on this image, uh, the classroom is the format that we use um, and it has multiple formats under itself. This big one that you can see on the left side, hopefully on your screen, is from London. You've done about five big classrooms that are hijacking uh, High Street. Uh, this is uh, Leicester Square in London. Uh, we did it in San Francisco, in, in New York, in Berlin, uh, to pretend to be a high-tech, high-design uh, technology store. And it's not actually presented as an exhibition. It's more like an experience that people think it is another concept store, maybe run by one of these corporations, and is modeled after, you know, our analysis how they do that, especially Apple and so on. Where these models I showed you before play a very important role, as you can see on the images on the right. The, on the bottom is the infographic of Google Empire, and then on the top is one of the first versions of the Google work and so on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we scale that because, you know, these big manifestations, this big kind of culture jamming we do here on the street is not scalable. It's expensive, it's difficult. Uh, yes, we have 30,000, 20,000 people visiting the space over three weeks, which is massive, but this specific place in specific locations only very limited number of wider public can, can see this. The other work I wanted to show you is uh, called Technologies of Hope, um, 100 Pandemic Technologies, which right now is an online uh, kind of an exhibit that is based, again, on a data set that is extremely hard to gather. So Steph and I were collecting, on the help of researchers, um, all the products that we could have find for last year and a half that address the pandemic, that address COVID, that propose different kinds of solutions to the pandemic. Because when you talk about technology and, and, and COVID, we all think about tracing mostly. But there's much more going on there. A lot of companies, businesses are pivoting, changing, uh, uh, you know, kind of finding the, the, 
the, the ideal problem for, for the solution that they already had kind of thing um, and so on. And we decided to present it in the, in the kind of unconventional way where on the digital screen, you have these two panels uh, the left one is this stable data set that but is presented in a kind of incomprehensible list of sentences. These sentences are taken from descriptions of the products that the companies are offering, while the right panel has two functions. One that is a scrollable text that you can read uh, our analysis of this data, and also when it's used as a dial. So when you read it through and the sections are coming up, the left part uh, is being highlighted at places where we've, we, we connected the products with, with the uh, teams that we used in descriptions. And we decided also to do something very different uh, to, to kind of, you can't really explore it by country, you cannot really explore it by, by the company name. There's a way of doing that, but this is not the direct way. And the reason was uh, that we really wanted uh, the visitor to be able to uh, kind of find their own way, find a language that resonates with them, and then through that discover so you have these two modes of operation here that you can dive into the data, but you have the limited number of filters you can use on purpose, um, and, and you can read our curation and interpretation if you like. And I think the important thing we've done here is the classification of that data, because you always have to do some sort of classification that would help the audience to look at this information through very different eyes, so usually not what you can find somewhere else. Um, what we did here, um, was dividing this uh, product into four categories. Uh, those that are for observing and they operate on kind of ambient high level. Uh, they don't necessarily look at individual data, but kind of accumulated, aggregated either on, you know, through satellites or um, scanning social media and so on. And we call it ambient intelligence. Uh, we look at those that are focusing on sensing. And that's kind of through devices, you know, wearables and so on, that are using sensors to look at biometric intelligence, individuals, but also groups, etc. And to other categories uh, and that are doing something different. Uh, they propose technologies that are helping mitigating. Um, so they look at the specifically mobility intelligence. So how can you still live and do things and so forth, while the virus is around and technology can help you to, to mitigate the risks. And you can look at the subcategories. And the last category was about modifying, which is technologies that are trying to teach us new behaviors to be able to adjust to the kind of new reality post pandemic, which is about behavioral intelligence. Um, and you can divide them into two groups. So the observing and sensing is fairly passive and uh, intelligence being gathered and then can be used, but the link between the uh, the, from whom the data has been extracted uh, to those who are using it is, is quite far away. By mitigating and modifying its, its active way of uh, instantly kind of making decisions for uh, the individual and groups in terms of giving them access or uh, forcing certain kind of behavior. And, and for us, the whole project was about actually realizing that all these technologies that are trying to prevent the spread and the kind of uh, impact of the virus are not focusing on the virus per se, they're focusing entirely on hosts, which is us, which is, you know, the vessels that are moving around unpredictably and, and spreading the virus. So you can also look at the product and, and see the description. For us also, it was very important to show the, the visual, the kind of mythology and, and visual uh, references that all these companies make through the vocabularies and images that they use to make us kind of uh, attracted to the way they see the world. And all these two projects kind of come together because in both cases, we're looking at fairly powerful sectors of society who have the technology, who have the know-how, who have the infrastructure uh, much bigger than anybody else that are able to access uh, these types of intelligence. Google is a great example of that, that sits over everything we do online. Um, but there are plenty of other companies, not only the Palantir I brought, but many other that we never heard of before who are in the same business model, who are kind of monopolizing the space of uh, extracting information, data, intelligence, evidence, uh, you name it. And we are in this kind of very unequal, actually using equal is not the right word to, to use here. 
Um, what we try to do with this kind of information that, as I said, is not ideal. This technologies of pandemic only look at 100 cases. We have the database of over 250 right now. But the point was like with the Google, we don't wanna just show all the data and, uh, and so on because that doesn't help. Um, it's actually overwhelming uh, and so on. So we try to curate it and try to extract the, the, the kind of less visible, more interesting parts uh, kind of uh, in a curatorial process. What we do with that, we either do these big exhibitions, but also they all turn into um, much simpler, much more accessible and uh, much more scalable objects like posters. This is just a graphic that we sent to our partners, schools, libraries, and so on. We call it a community edition of the same kind of a content we, we use for the large classrooms, where we also enable people to adapt, localize, uh, translate all the content and, and kind of add the context that is important for the audiences or where they're from and so on, etc. So that's for us very important because this is how what we know scales up and travels. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, what that means, um, up until now, we, last year and a half, we had uh, this number of visitors, 290,000. We had 232 events and in 47 countries where people use different constellations of these objects. And for us, it's important that the Google piece becomes the paper version that then becomes kind of join the dots, a fragment of a workshop and uh, exercise that people can conduct themselves and uh, ask questions. It's all about education, critical thinking and uh, engagement and uh, engagement with any level of dealing with data that you're capable of for which you have infrastructure or, or knowledge uh, how to do. So those are the two projects I wanted to kind of bring um, and talk about how difficult it is, regardless of the fact that we're swimming in the uh, seas and oceans of data, to actually gather data information and evidence about those who are the gatekeepers of that universe. Not only the big five companies, but many others. Um, and how hard it is to understand their politics, their long-term strategies, and uh, how they see you know, the users. Of course, for Google, it is all about advertisement and so on, etc. But it's not only. This is how they initially make the money by allowing uh, advertisers to use the profiles that they collected and uh, can be targeted and, and so on. Um, but for us, it's very important to find kind of tangible, physical, intriguing, interesting ways through objects, posters, animations, and so on to engage as wide as possible audience uh, because everybody is actually aware of the importance of kind of living in the digital space. Um, so I'm curious to hear more about the other projects. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, on this page, you can see two links to the classroom and to the technologies of hope. We have plenty of other examples of our work, but I wanted to bring the ones that are difficult ones and we try to make them accessible in one or another way. My clock broke so I don't know how much time I have left, probably none, and I finish here and I'm looking forward to uh, questions. Actually, I promise to keep questions for the end because the, the idea is to, to have this open discussion, but I have a really short one. Uh, you said everyone is aware, but what is the reaction? of people when they are on one of these black rooms? Oh, no, so this is probably the most important part for us. Like the reason we do this stuff at different scales is because that gives us direct uh, connection and access to different sort of audiences. And people who come to the classroom or either go to see the content to the libraries, etc. cetera, uh, the reactions are all you can imagine from uh, being uh, shocked that actually certain things uh, are happening in a certain way that people kind of think they may be, they may be not, and, and so on in terms of uh, data collection, in terms of how, 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 how it works, in terms how things are designed to keep us uh, kind of attached, if not addicted, if not dependent from the devices and services and so, and so forth. Um, they are 
um, extremely interested in the politics. The uh, audiences are extremely interested in the in the business models behind it. How is that possible? The people often ask questions about who and how is regulating it, or why is it not regulated, uh, and so on. Um, people also uh, like the fact that I think the the, the principles here that. Uh, the way we present this information is fairly ambiguous. So we don't present it in such a way that this is Marag or Tactical Tech tell you how it works and what you should think about it. I think this process, uh, this is my time out, this process should happen in the either in a small circle of people who come and visit and look at it together or within a single person that where we, they go through the exhibition or uh, online or offline through multiple objects they start building their own narrative and their own questions. And this process is really appreciated. I think that, uh, we have a quite uh, a rich feedback system uh, that to the partners or directly if we have our own events that we collect an an anonymously from, from people. And that's fascinating for us and very extremely helpful in designing new objects and um, new kind of uh, engagements, uh, if you like. So hopefully that answers your question. So now it's the time to change the scale of the of the observation of going from the personal data to the to this earth uh, observation. So it, it's the turn of John and, and Sophie that they are going to share some of their ideas, some of the way of, of their work uh, at territorial agency. John? Thank you, Mar. Uh, thank you, Mar. And uh, uh, of course, Marek, this uh, was an intriguing uh, set of projects that you have there. The hypothesis is very simple. And uh, territorial agency sets out both as a project and as an organization. The project uh, is linked with the idea that uh, agency, the capacity of acting in the world, is uh, distributed and not held by entities that are bonded. Uh, they are territorial. Uh, and uh, territories are really uh, sign systems. They are uh, semantic systems of uh, keeping people uh, away or entities away from what uh, maintains you alive. So the uh, territory of uh, a bird uh, is uh, the semantic connections that uh, with the things and the fluxes of energy and food and information that keep that bird or the communities of bird alive. What is uh, uh, peculiar in uh, the contemporary time in the Anthropocene is that what keeps humans alive has become an agency that is so vast that has uh, started uh, uh, shaping all the other agencies of the planet, what uh, uh, James Lovelock of course calls Gaia the self-organizing uh, conditions of uh, life, even though self and organizing are very complex uh, uh, terms that are uh, at the basis uh, of uh, uh, life on, on this rather uninhabitable and hostile portion of the solar system where the Earth is. So it's uh, almost inexplicable uh, how life can be on this planet. We should have fried away a long time ago. So the question uh, of agency, uh, I think is uh, uh, very clear in what Marek's uh, beautiful projects show. And, and I'm so happy to finally get the chance to be on the same panel as uh, this amazing uh, group and organization that is you know, bringing uh, to the public uh, so many uh, insights of our world. The point of the Anthropocene is really based on uh, the, a new epoch where our agency is shaping everybody else. And this is maybe best characterized uh, by the notion of the technosphere. The technosphere is the sum of uh, humans and everything that we need to remain alive as a species. So everything that we eat, so domesticated animals and plants maybe, uh, and uh, the material fluxes that are associated with them, you know, infrastructures of transport and uh, picking plums and uh, organizing wages for picking plums and the information flows. And of course the energy flows that sustain humanity. The point is that we are now to in a situation where uh, our activity is causing so much debris 
we are not recycling anything of our activity. In particular, we're not recycling in any way the incredible amounts of uh, carbon that are associated with uh, the combustion of our main source of energy, which is uh, still fossil fuels. So we are sit in a situation where we all eat and we all stay alive because of fossil fuels. And this is creating a debris uh, in the sky and around us that we is the debris of the technosphere. The conditions are really uh, difficult to grasp. Uh, you can imagine that the technosphere, of course, is everything connected to the internet, everything that is connected to technology. But uh, we tried uh, to measure how heavy it is with scientists. So everything that uh, you can imagine on Earth is transformed by uh, humans counts up in a rough estimate, a really rough estimate, uh, which is really you know, on a conservative uh, side, around 30 trillion tons. The other entity that is in the trillions of tons uh, is the biomass. There's no other entity on the planet uh, that is so heavy. Uh. So what we have is that everything that we imagine, technology, the hospitals, the electricity grid that is uh, allowing this conversation to be both in Linz, and I say hello to our uh, friends in Linz and online, is consuming so much energy and putting out a debris in the sky and in, on the ground. And what is interesting is, of course, that the debris is now uh, interfacing with uh, the Earth system so much that uh, we no longer are in a situation to call it the Earth system. That system of dynamics that are completely uh, interdependent as opposed to the world system, uh, the equally interdependent and complex dynamics that regulate societies, economies, uh, business cycles and uh, prices and uh, the capacity of uh, revolutions to uh, act on. That distinction is no longer possible. We are completely intertwined with the earth. So the question is, how do we get to know about this? How do we uh, start acting on this? And we start seeing, I think, an interesting uh, split. And this is uh, the uh, split between the transformations that are happening in, uh, let's say, earth observation. That means all the knowledge that scientists are producing, all the knowledge that um, uh, institutions are producing by looking at the earth, both uh, in a direct way through a group of uh, citizens and marking down what they looked at, and then maybe sharing that information, but even more complex programs like the satellites that are uh, orbiting the earth and sending down terabytes every uh, minute of uh, data that is uh, then to be processed and analyzed in the very complex modeling of the earth. What, how do we combine that with the structures of the other side of the information fluxes that characterize the entrance into the Anthropocene that Marek just brilliantly uh, indicated to us? How do we have an earth system observation and a world system observation, not detached, but start combining and start seeing how this in a very strange way could be understood as the first moment of um, almost um, self-awareness of Gaia. Uh, how do we start adding uh, self-awareness to uh, Gaia? So this is really uh, the very simple proposition uh, of a project like Oceans in Transformation where we start indicating, maybe we can start showing uh, the video uh, so that we have a better understanding for the audience online of what uh, we are uh, describing. Where we started looking at how the scientists are uh, trying to understand what is happening to the ocean. What is the ocean? How does it operate? Uh, is it uh, a dynamics that uh, is stable? Uh, is uh, the uh, conditions of the ocean a systemic condition that has uh, fluxes and ebbs uh, that are uh, repeated over time? Uh, and can we start the video? I don't know if it's uh, visible online. Maybe also for the audience uh, in the uh, theater. And what we start understanding is that the difficult grasping of how the uh, 
ocean works is uh, augmented by the fact that the ocean, of course, is one, one large body of water on the planet. But the ways of knowing it are so different that we call, uh, we cannot understand how our ocean is different from the ocean of uh, uh, someone in the Pacific. Is it simply different uh, ways of understanding the same ocean or are there actually multiple oceans? And so the hypothesis for us is that there are multiple oceans. There's, the oceans are plural and uh, we need to find ways to engage with this plurality. And this is really the proposition of um, uh, the project to start bringing together on sort of say screens, the uh, plurality of ways of uh, engaging with uh, the oceans and measuring it, uh, measuring how it has changed over the uh, past and how it is changing now, in order to somehow have the, what we used to call the world system, the information of societies, start engaging more directly with uh, the transformations of the earth system. And what is interesting, of course, is that the transformations are multi-temporal. So if, when we look at the, the project, you will see that it's organized through a series of tangent lines, the trajectories that span uh, the planet and intercept both changes and tipping points of uh, the complex climatic regimes of the Earth without making any distinction between land and ocean. With, and they intersect complex tipping point of the, of the uh, world economies and the uh, cultures. So for instance, when we cross the Atlantic, of course we encounter the black Atlantic of uh, the uh, slave trade or better the uh, trade of uh, enslaved people. Uh, and uh, when we uh, look at those uh, remnants, we encounter the contemporary forms of uh, deprivation of life through the extension of plantations, not 200 years ago, but today, the deforestation of the Amazon, the deforestation of sub-Saharan Africa. Or when we look at the complex transformation of, um, uh, like the video that um, is supposed to be showing, of uh, the one of the most productive uh, areas in uh, the planet in terms of life, uh, the Humboldt current that brings the waters from the Southern Ocean all the way upstream uh, to uh, following the South American coast and creates this incredible and flourishing of uh, life and uh, fish and birds and uh, plankton. Altogether, we start seeing how that is waning, but it's also intersected with complex processes of uh, cultural exploitation through the uh, long-term impact of capitalism and contemporary forms of under the radar exploitation of resources like deep sea mining, which is the largest threat that we are going to face when we are decarbonizing. Uh, in order to decarbonize, we need so many of the so-called rare earth uh, minerals that we are now going to destroy completely the ocean life by engaging in uh, crazy uh, extraction of it. So the project is really trying to uh, mark and position so to say, semantic notions of understanding what is happening with uh, the earth system uh, uh, understanding of where these things are. And the project is really then trying, once we bring them together, to uh, engage uh, the different groups that are producing this information, the different groups that are uh, engaging with them. And they range from groups operating with uh, artificial intelligence, trying to monitor the placement of vessels and their activities uh, on the oceans to local organizations that are trying to organize their fishing uh, uh, stocks. So we start understanding that we need to bring the multiplicity of oceans in, and form it into a multiplicity of uh, discussions, a multiplicity of way of knowing what is that agency that we have now created. And this is really a short uh, introduction uh, to Oceans in Transformation, which is um, uh, really uh, an in incredibly generous offer uh, given to us by uh, Tissen Bonemitsa uh, Art Academy to engage in a long-term research in trying to engage different groups, different polities into thinking together the oceanic, not no longer just the ocean and land separate, but the oceanic as a way of being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that's wow. uh, the short introduction. I do, it's uh, difficult for us because we don't see what is uh, shared uh, of the video, but uh, what you saw basically is a number of different data sets and you see how incoherent they are, how different resolutions, how different projections, uh, how different uh, ways of understanding uh, the oceans are available. And those images are full of gaps, full of noise, full of misinformation, and they are nothing else than a starting point for the conversation where we bring together different groups and different entities. Uh, and uh, it's a trajectory that went from Antarctica, uh, where the ice is melting uh, because of um, global warming. Uh, actually, because of the ecological catastrophe, uh, climate chaos that we have uh, unleashed, all the way up to the beacon of uh, science about life, the Galapagos Islands archipelago, uh, which is the location, of course, of uh, the one of the most incredible moments of thought in uh, human history, the uh, voyages of uh, Charles Darwin and the uh, understanding of evolution of life. I'm afraid, John and, and Sophie, that we need to move on. But uh, I think what is really relevant no, on, on the world no, that you were showing, it's how no, you are mediators no, between something which is science no, and, and all the knowledge that is produced, and how can we turn that into really a storytelling that can bring the change uh, on. No? It's, it's a question that I have for all of them uh, after. I remind also uh, our audience that you can uh, send us uh, the questions and finally in the wrap up, we will try to, to, to have the occasion to, to ask uh, all of them. So let's move to Asia. Uh, Asia, are you here? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'll start right away. Um, so Joe Cinema, uh, the project that is, I'm doing with uh, Sol Vesus, who is not here today. Uh, so this project uh, started in 2018 uh, as a conceptual proposition. We were speculating about how the Earth is recording itself, for example, through um, aerial imaging, through satellites, but also through personal gadgets, CCTV cameras, uh, various sensors in and off ground, and then how these were used for monitoring, tracking, surveillance, and whatnot. So we imagined how the planet is fully wrapped uh, with signals, which are mediated technologically, and each having their own parameters of scale and temporality, some of them translated into a visual form, some of them remain um, numerical, most of them eventually being operationalized in many different ways. So there is this massive archive of data that is a constantly recorded version of the Earth. So uh, we've had our first proposition to consider these processes of recording, transmitting, archiving, stitching, and distribution of data as those through which the Earth is recording itself. And the second proposition was to consider these assemblages of technologic uh, mediations as a vastly distributed cinematic apparatus, um, a camera. Now I will uh, share a screen to show you a little, uh, a short video clip. Mm.
So this is a um, clip from our first episode, which is called uh, The Making of Earth. And this was shot inside a massive cinema theater, which sits at the center of a newly built uh, campus in uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Uh, in 2018, we learned about a newly launched project, which is called the Digital Belt and Road, hosted by this institute. And what this project promised immediately caught our attention um, to synchronize all Earth observation data through an international and centralized platform for various users, from researchers to contractors. So the proposition made by this platform, um, announced by Chinese Academy of Sciences, was our first case study, and it strongly resonated with the topic of geocinema. Uh, with much of enthusiasm, this platform uh, announced a new era of management and governance that will be made possible through big Earth data that is harvested through multiple infrastructures that employ different, uh, different sensor-based techniques. So for, our, for us, the questions were, what are these new forms of governance and what does the image of the Earth, as well as the processes of its sensing and imaging, um, have to do with this? Uh, in, in that cinema theater, we were invited to watch a bombastic three-dimensional film where a strong narrative voice advertised humanity's main challenges, uh, which, are, which is climate change and suggesting that DBAR is a platform that is designed uh, to solve these problems. So the question of representation inevitably popped up, especially since there are so many conversations today um, within the expanding field of environmental humanities that refer to the image of the Earth while speaking about climate change, future modernity, extraction, and the Anthropocene. It is an image of a blue sphere that is floating in space and feels very familiar well known and uh, the earth here is always presented as this holistic object uh, that is linked um, to us uh, through narratives of our shared home oikos a place that we should all take care of and all of that started somewhat 50 years ago with um, the united nations's message um, about environmental protection so we argue that the project deploys environmentalism as this new uniform ideology, which is mobilized against prospective climate change, where under the call to recover the planet, uh, big data is accurate from geological formations, social relations, urban development, and more, so that the Earth can be seen in greater detail. Here, disasters and other risks, markets, populations, and climates can be algorithmically calculable and mappable as the nearest future forecast. So this panel today was invited to speak about artistic and activist approaches to make data tangible for general audiences. And this is precisely the seeming intangibility of data regimes and their effects uh, was the starting point for our practice that eventually unfolded as um, a documentary led research. Uh, the imaging techniques today are operationalized in ways that, are, that escape immediate visibility they are part of larger constellations that include migrating forms of governance um, that spread through the territorialized flows of global, global markets. So first, we decided to physically approach infrastructures that mobilize Earth observation, um, Earth observation images, and through interviews, attempts to access sites, going through bureaucratic procedures, we wanted to investigate what this platform is and what are the implications of it. So now another short clip. Probably. The way we we living today, we we collecting autonomously data that definitely we are not going to explore. To give you a very a specific example, I, I visited recently the one of the places where they collect Landsat data in the US, in Sioux Falls, in uh, South Dakota. And we, we, I, I was able to witness the process of the, the collection of the data from the satellites. Basically the idea is the following. Whatever data you're collecting in every different round the satellite passes and, and you have really, it's impressive because the, 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 the ground station just opens up, then it moves, 
to the direction of satellites and then it starts to receive data and then you collect data for some uh, 15 minutes I think and then they archive it and you can imagine there's an enormous amount of data we have data since 1970 something so now we have a technology that allows us to have a satellite we are able to look to the whole earth from the outside that's a real revolution because it's a radical disruption because you're not mapping something from the inside you map it from the outside the belt and road is just one example of um, spheres of influence which includes data which is invisible is not territorial includes all the other things so it's spheres of influence They've been investing in each and every different country in Africa, China. Railroads are being built with funding directly from China. The companies that go there are Chinese companies. Telecommunication, railroads, uh, particularly railroads, main buildings, big buildings. The African Union building was funded fully by Chinese, for free. It's not for free, because there's a rent agreement, a long-term rent agreement. The model is simple. It's a long-term 50 years rent agreement. After the 50 years, they have to give back. That's what's happening in some countries that are not able to pay back the thing. So, but this is not imperialism. It's, it's, it's in pure uh, capitalist trading or investment. And the country does it if it wants. So by mixing ethnographic and historical research related to remote sensing with investigative journalism of sorts and uh, documentary-led research, uh, we attempt to understand how processes of sensing and imaging work technically and what is the political economy behind these processes. And through that, we wanted to question the already uh, too convenient message of a climate crisis as it being instrumentalized by nation states and private sector, and which when employed by platforms uh, such as DBAR and their multiple collaborations across the globe, um, creates a situation of obscure geometries of power, which are very hard to locate um, as they operate beyond uh, the logic of nation states. Uh, for example, in this case, through what is pitched as um, a capacity building for scientific exchange, states, corporations, and individual agents accurate sets of data, including those from and for developing countries, uh, which, did not have, which do not have their uh, capacity for the remote sensing uh, infrastructures. So the design of the Earth observation platforms presupposes the design uh, of these economic relationships, while data is being used to recognize business opportunities, um, as well as to preemptively develop risk management responses, for the dramatic consequences that are caused by these operations in the first um, place. Uh, so I suggest I stop here so then we can have uh, more time for uh, questions. Th thanks a lot, Deja. Um, so now it's, it's the time uh, for discussion. Uh, my idea was that each of us uh, can ask the, the other, but just to, to, you know, to break the, the, the ice. No? Um, I see you know, uh, a lot in, in common in, in both the three approaches in the sense you know, that we are all of us you know, using data and technology to visualize either or you not know, these critical challenges that are related you know, to our activity on Earth, either the social facts you know, that we are building you know, as, as a society and as we you know we were seeing right now you know, with these appealing images you know, from, from um, geocinema, you know, how we have you know, behind networks of power you know, that somehow you know, uh, are on top you know, of, of these social packs. You know? So my first question for the three of you would be, you know, uh, we had you know, somehow uh, different technologies in, in, in history that allows us, you know, for example, 
in the you know in in cartography to actually you know be a tool to to have the power you know, on the decision making uh, of a territory you know so what does it make the difference uh, right now is the idea that the challenges are really critical and we are like you no know, uh, in a moment where we are fighting for for our survival, it's the idea of the scalability and the, and the no, globality of the phenomena itself. It's the availability of data. So, from your perspective, what does it make the difference uh, in this critical challenge that all of you from different angles are trying to to address? <laughs> I lose them. <laughs> no, I maybe I will jump in. And uh, apologies, and Sophia, mm -hmm. to uh, leave us for a minute or two. Um, I think that the uh, main point is, or oh, the biggest challenge is exactly uh, that image that Asia uh, invoked of the blue planet, and uh, which is uh, a cartographic image. It's a globe, uh, and uh, there's. Uh, one image that is uh, what our friend Bruno Latour will say, the pumpkin. Uh, it's the size of a pumpkin. Uh, it's not the earth, it's just a big pumpkin. And uh, the fact that we still th talk about cartography in relationship to a globe, uh, rather than talking about the very uh, basic condition uh, of a lively uh, planet is uh, indicating of the major challenge. Uh, we all, are uh, living in the debris of uh, the modern who thought that they will be able to control through more information, through more knowledge. That is the major uh, challenge. We still are uh, in a situation where we are thinking that to uh, solve the problem of too much technology, we need more technology. And uh, this is a real uh, difficulty because, of course, it's what keeps us alive. So we're not uh, saying that we should somehow disentangle ourselves, but the real difficulty is that we are so dependent on technology for the conditions of operation that uh, it's so difficult to disentangle ourselves and this has to do also with uh, the so-called power that lies behind these technologies it's a power that is not achieving the basic conditions uh, that we have all collectively set up uh, of maintaining uh, a pathway to decarbonization that would lead us to uh, survival. It's a power that is becoming more and more uh, unable to organize the information wars, if not information wars that are uh, not allowing us to uh, surpass this pandemic in spite of the incredible advancements of technology, in particular of, uh, life science technologies that will allow us to get rid of uh, the pandemic. Uh, so this is a real difficult situation because we talk about power as if it is always uh, somehow hidden behind, hidden somewhere else. Uh, but the difficulties in our mind, and this may be uh, my way of uh, relaunching it to uh, Marek, is that the intricacies of, um, uh, the, of contemporary intrusions of technology in everyday life have become so prevalent that is you know, the, making it apprehensible uh, be, starts maybe being a project that we all shared, you know, how to democratize uh, the internet, how to democratize information. It seems that we might be at a cusp that that was the project, but we are now entering a completely different condition where that turns out to be you know, an incredible uh, effort that needs to be readdressed because uh, the ways in which uh, uh, different forms of power are operating are obliterating uh, democracy, are obliterating capacity of acting. And so we need to maybe at the ante transform completely our activism and transform completely the way we imagine uh, sociality, the way we imagine institutions. And uh, I think this is. Uh, me passing the ball to Marek because I know that you are uh, such an incredibly passionate activist uh, about uh, the neutrality of the internet. 
Thank you, since I've been triggered. You, you made so many nice comments that I have to think how I can return them to you because I really like the work you're doing as well. Um, I would actually stay away from uh, being framed as, a, as an activist. I think this is how we started 20 years ago. And right now we see ourselves much more as a kind of in the educational and uh, awareness raising and kind of working more broadly where we still work with a lot of activists and so forth. Um, but uh, as you said, it, it's quite important to understand that the frameworks that we, we've been using, that either privacy or, or rights, they are important and we support them, etc. But we have to look also beyond and outside to be able to comprehend uh, what this um, new world of um, intelligence gathering that is understood purely uh, through the lens of data, um, how it is not only undermining, as you said, you know, institutions or democracy itself, if you like, but that's a kind of complicated thing to talk about, democracy where, institutions where. Um, and, um, we can get very sentimental about it. I think for me, it's it's um, it's important. I think to to realize that we kind of falling into this gap that um, either we're gonna create a digital twin of everything. Earth is an example, or universe, or whatever, because we believe so much in power of technology we have at hand. That is actually extremely primitive, and is extremely dependent on uh, you know specific people, specific groups. There's no uh, superpower intelligence out there. Uh, it only happens in the imagination of some white billionaires who, who think of singularity and, uh, and they uh, have these dreams about controlling that singularity and owning it and then so forth being able to sort of the problems of the world. This is a fictional world um, of this kind of in individuals that doesn't exist actually. Uh, what exists is a very complex, complicated situation and that is you know, de deteriorating and we live in this fantasy that, um, you know, another technology, regardless of the fact that each technology solves some problems that creates other set of problems, will solve these problems and other problems and its own problems at some point and you're going to be fine, is also a, a very risky strategy for anybody to follow. And what we try to kind of uh, create are these moments of reflection and kind of stop the time for a second and be able to to think about, is this the only way of uh, understanding where we are? Is, is it the only way to understand who actually have a, a power and infrastructure and, and um, a context that I can uh, impact uh, the direction we would try to change the situation and so forth? And, you know, and as you said, the time is um, running out. Um, on multiple levels. So I think um, in, in this question, you know, the, what's the difference, uh, Mar, you ask, mm -hmm. between technology now and then? Well, the then technology was not related to, to information per se. Technology was much more analogous, if you like. We're living in a technology that is um, kind of offshoot of a cybernetic way, cybernetic way of thinking about uh, technology, which is about feedback loops, is about intelligence, and is this trust that if we only gather all the information, if we would make every single atom or whatever smaller element that we can discover addressable, and we could compute them, we would be able to predict things, and because we can predict things, then we can also uh, make decisions about how they're going to evolve, which is impossible task. And um, I'm not going to give any answers right now more than that, but I think this is a very, very different story. And the gatekeepers are unaccountable. And not only and when you look at the gatekeepers, of course, the, the biggest ones that are the companies who, who owns these technologies, who owns the infrastructures. There's a small number of them. And they're totally untransparent and absolutely unaccountable for uh, what they do, how they do, and where. Uh, but also, it is, this is the story about users. Uh, we users are also accountable. Technology can be used in multiple different ways, can be used for good and for bad. The same technology which is owned by X, Y, Z, doesn't matter. So there's also accountability of the users, and there's also accountability on the level of, um, you talk about tech, kind of ethics of technology, or um, of the designers, but not the user interface designers, system designers, who code. And uh, there's also very little accountability there. So I think we have to sort these things in the first place. And I think I pass it on to as you know. So relating to this idea of, of the governance, no, that you actually you were pointing out, no, we are at the point where we have more information, but this information is private. So 
it means now that from the public side we need to have these infrastructures to keep the data you know, uh, public uh, also that we citizens we have a lot of power you know, to decide with whom of the tech, big, big, big tech corporates we want to you know, have relations uh, with you know, what we do with uh, our personal data so you no know, <laughs> the scenario you know, <laughs> is there you no know, how can we build uh, you know this this government and it's something that a little bit no it's it's also worrying us you no know, from uh, from outside you no know? so we we I'm I'm, I'm an artist you know, as uh, as John you no know? I come from the side of the practice and it's a, and it's another type of activism you no know? and for I think you no know, that as far as we see things uh, being able to put you no know, on the table these critical challenges that we have today being able to do that with data and not with intuitions you no know, to be clear no which is the size of, of the problem that that we have no it, it's a great opportunity but at the same time what it's worrying uh, uh, us it's which is the gap no that that we have now between no uh, this scientific community these people who no uh, has the skills uh, together with again eh, with the citizens and the public uh, side or the public body to uh, bring these problems no, uh, to the action, which is the gap that you see or the level of maturity in this bridging the, the two sides together no, between uh, the, the, like the people no, that, that you know, are, are trying to build these hypotheses no, and these projects and the people who's going to take actions. Eh, by people, I mean no, uh, a, a city councillor, I mean, no, uh, a civil uh, organization, a planet, no, uh, uh, observation uh, organization, or even a citizen it, itself, no. So how far are we, and which are the no the challenges that we have ahead of us, no, to solve or to bridge uh, uh, this gap that it's no it's somehow evident. Asia, maybe. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm actually wanted to continue the conversation uh, <laughs> regarding the challenges uh, because I mean, I think also for me the crucial is or like a problem. There is a problem with uh, these very universalized statements all the time, like we, humanity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so uh, because I guess also the conversations about environment or these challenges should start with the question, what counts as life and what counts as human, of course. And um, speaking of these processes of um, um, data uh, acquisition, um, I see after doing our research where we uh, spend lots of time with like scientists, but also in different conferences where scientists and politicians meet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I see that there is this huge gap between what people in humanities think and uh, the concepts they propose and the challenges that they outline with like, what should we do, how we should address, how everything should be changed. And then this completely different environment of scientists. And as we all know, uh, in each country, in each nation state, science massively caters to um, the overall politics of the country and that politic is still defined by the logic of the GDP. So it's still kind of like a, a million universes away from these conversations that we have in the world of humanities. So, uh, and whenever we speak to scientists, they're always, um, they're absolutely okay with how science operates within the politics of their state. Um, and for example, working on this digital Belt and Road project, lots of scientific institutes, they are fully following the logic of the, the platform itself, which is operating to build more infrastructures for uh, extractivist uh, politics. So yeah, I think the, the challenge is that there is still this um, kind of uh, division between what people in humanities do, what people in uh, uh, natural sciences do, and the, uh, the politics of it. Um, and I guess for that, and I wanted to link it back to the problem of representation, because we actually need more nuanced narratives then, not the ones about the, the blue sphere and, you know, this very fancy eco, ecological conversation, but something that actually accounts for the difference. 
And as Rosie Braidotti said, to understand that we are all different, but we are in this together. So kind of more nuanced understanding of, of life, of these challenges and the narratives um, that can help us. But then also, I think <clears throat> um, what uh, was mentioned earlier, kind of still very cartographic imagination and not only towards the planet, but in general. So we always say like, there's this power, there's this society, like some humans, something, but all of this is already blurred as much as well as the kind of the, the borders, you know, and I guess we need some kind of topological imagination already, something that can account for this very multiple var variables and how these different categories already bled uh, into each other. So I'll stop here. John, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Mar, um, I think that, yeah, no, I understand the um, notion of the gap. Mm. Look, on one side, there is uh, knowledge produced, and on the other side, there's action and you uh, lacking. Or... Now, I think that that is really at the center of uh, the old ways in which uh, um, activism operated. A sort of uh, deficit, you know, a gap. There's a deficit between what you feel. Uh, no, if only you would feel what I feel for the whales, you would act differently. If only you would know what I know about human rights violation in Belarus, you will act differently. Now, I think that this is a really important uh, uh, conversation uh, that, and it's structured incredible uh, efforts by many uh, organizations and uh, mostly non-governmental organizations to provide uh, uh, better understanding and uh, the framework for critical uh, debate in what used to be called the civil society. And, but that deficit uh, structure of activism, uh, and this is a um, wording, uh, it's a scheme that I've really learned from our friends at, in Greenpeace, in particular, Charlie Chronic. The idea is that uh, no, activism can only be uh, operating on that no, making aware or making more sensitive, more making you more engaged with, somehow can be flanked with a completely different ways of organizing uh, action. And that is to be within, to be uh, operating with the groups that have uh, capacity to act and modify the negotiation systems and modify the actions. So uh, I think... Asia uh, is really right about the fact that it's a problem of image. It's a problem of, not of representation, I would, uh, but that's a different discussion. It's a problem of the image, uh, whether there's a distinction between what is alive and what is not alive and what counts on that. And the issue of the image, of the planetary image uh, that we have is of course at the center of the entire enlightenment, the entire uh, rise of capitalism and uh, the what we used to call extractive capitalism, which has now turned into the logistical capitalism. And at the center of logistical capitalism, there is an idea, of course, actually, it's not a center, it's a line that crosses it. There's an idea that the line, which is a production line or a distribution line, can be improved and can be improved with access, total access, more access, total access to information, total access, complete access to uh, resources, to maneuverability of uh, conditions, and simultaneously a notion that that access needs to be certified, the certification of origin of the product on the supply chain, which is of course uh, an imperial and uh, colonial idea of uh, origin. Now, how to operate in that environment where the managerial structures of complex uh, always accelerate the improvement are so close and approximate so much the idea of data, uh, availability of uh, your heartbeat at, uh, on your uh, watch, uh, the possibilities of constant modification of information uh, by acting back on it. I think this is a real challenge on institutions of cohabitation and uh, the little contribution that we do as architects is to say, look, Architecture has turned into this 
catastrophic condition of rapid urbanization, uh, increase uh, of uh, energy uh, and uh, incredible debris. But at the center of this millennial structure of thought and practice, which is a Holocene structure of architecture, there's still this notion of cohabitation and conviviality. There's still a possibility of imagining uh, imminence uh, of different ways of being. The point is that in its antiquity and its obsolescence, architecture still carries this uh, spark and this capacity of bringing things together and shaping uh, new coalitions. And at the same time, it is so shaped by notions of representation and staticity. You know, things need to be static and fixed and stable. There's an entire vocabulary about architecture, the foundations, the framework, the, uh, the facade uh, behind which uh, all kinds of dirty business happens. But what is interesting is one starts looking at situations, even like the one that we have today, is that the new realm of the digital image and the digital uh, capacity has completely opened up our capacities of understanding how we shape space and how we shape being together. I am looking at an image with the obvious condition that the, I'm speaking to people. I'm not looking at uh, representation of people. When I uh, see uh, Mar nodding, I know that that is not a, a representational condition of Mar. And if I switch off my camera, uh, I also know that uh, you will think that I've not disappeared. Uh, it's not that my representation. So what we start seeing is affect. We start noticing that the conditions of contemporary presence at a distance. Uh, I'm sorry that I cannot be in uh, Austria today, but I am in uh, the other uh, homes. This is changing completely what it used to be thought as intramuros and extramuros. And this is a completely different relationship with the uh, capacity of acting. And I think this is where the notion of lack and uh, needs to be and deficit of um, knowledge in order to act needs to be uh, focusing on how to become sensitive to this new effective condition that surrounds us how to be, become somehow more in tune how do we become uh, able to uh, sense other ways of sensing and this is what, what i think asia was referring to is need to be expanding the notions of what it means to be alive, what it means to live. Mario muted. Yeah, I'm afraid that what I was saying that I'm afraid we read this point where we have this just one sentence uh, round if you want to, to add something. Maybe Marek, you want to make a closing comment? Just one minute. <laughs> yeah, now, I mean, I can prove that it's very difficult to be clever in one minute. I would say for me, this is a partially crisis of imagination. And what I invite people to is to think, think outside of the box and stop believing into techno propaganda and follow the you know techno PR and making us think that techno solution is the only way out. There are many other ways of thinking about uh, the future. We don't have to speculate about it. We have enough information around. That's my minute. Great. So it was my my pleasure to be together, even if we are really, really far away uh, with all of you. Uh, thanks again to Marek, to John, and to Asia, to Anne Sophie, uh, that she will be <laughs> behind somewhere. Um, so uh, for the rest of the audience, keep tuned because there is a really, really, really interesting next panel that is going to expand on some of, of the of the ideas, which is called creating with data from Mars to, to entrepreneurship. That is going to be moderated by the professor Elena Timber and hosted by the Digital Innovation Hub Media Futures. So uh, we keep the conversation on on the network and with this cross collaboration that has been proven to be so necessary to build no, this new imaginary using data and technology and, and, and including uh, all the actors that, that should be needed. 
So thank you for listening to us and have a nice continuation on this start day. Data. This is part of the Starts Day here at Ars Electronica, a new digital deal. Um, in this final session of the morning program, we'll dive a bit deeper into the relationship between data and creativity, exploring some of the tensions that artists, creatives, scientists, entrepreneurs, and us all actually have witnessed over the past decade or so, as more and more data has been collected and shared and used in so many different ways. I'm Elena Simpa. I'm a scientific and technical lead of Media Future, which is a virtual accelerator and residency program co-funded with European public money. In Media Futures, we're working with 19 teams from all over the world, with startups, with artists, and with um, combinations of the two, in an area which affects us all greatly, online misinformation and polarization. And you'll hear from some of these teams today and about their Media Futures project. But to set the stage, um, we'll start today with a talk by Dr. Julie Freeman, whom I had the pleasure to work with in a project in the UK called Data Stories, where we looked at people's interactions with data in a post-truth society. Back then, she was at the Open Data Institute in London, where she established their Data as Culture art program. And I have to say, I learned a lot from her. Through her practice, Julie translates complex processes and data from natural sources into uh, all sorts of interesting artworks, and her work explores that relationship between science and the natural world, which has become so important in so many different ways over the past 18 months. Um, She's trained as a computer scientist and as an artist, and in her bio I read that she considers the two to be the same, which is something I would love to explore at some point in time. Um, she has a PhD from Queen Mary University in London, um, with a focus on the investigation of data as an art material, which I hope we'll hear more about today. So Julie, thank you so much for being here with us, and uh, we're ready to hear more from you. No problem, thanks uh, Eleanor. I'm just going to um share this so yeah i was going to um just take the opportunity to, to talk about a few things that i've learned while i've been using data as an art material over the past um couple of decades uh, one way or another and um just to explain how just through the artwork the things that have occurred to me that i think are important for for my own practice but also maybe could be helpful for other people to to think about but I wanted to start with um, looking at the, the idea of sort of perception of what we think we're looking at and what we're not looking at. And this um, this image is a representation of my one of my first ever drawings from nursery school. And my mum, she put, they put me off to nursery school, and everyone at the end of the session, everyone came out with pictures of houses and you know their mum and dad stick men and stuff like that. And I came out with all these pictures of almost perfectly drawn black black circles. And when my mum asked the teacher um, how I'd got on, she said, oh, Judy's been really happy drawing circles all day. And apparently 
I was at, I got absolutely livid at the pair of them and I was like they are not circles they are holes and this was my kind of like first <laughs> realization that actually what you know what you're doing and what people are seeing are, can be very different things especially when you're working with kind of ab abstract forms so I think from a very young age I was always kind of maybe looking at things in a slightly different way but I think okay, just, to, just to check if the presentation is playing because we haven't seen the holes if we were supposed to see oh okay um you... so I we see the the cover page the it cover says, slide, it um, says... but we don't see anything beyond that Are you seeing this? And uh, now we're still seeing data as an art material. Okay. Maybe we tried to reshare that. Yeah, let me stop it and start it. Oh. Is it 2021, people? I don't know. We're at the beginning like, of September. Like, why? Why, why, why? You would right. think that with, yeah, so we see now the next slide. Now, if we try okay. to. Okay. If I. Right. Does that, are they moving? So at the moment, we see, I've learned that even the concept of data has power, but I don't know if this will advance and unless you press a button or something. Okay. Because it, yes. so it's not, oh. it's not when I. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah. So what's happening is that if I if it I play, play it, it doesn't show it. Okay. I yeah. can do it like this. Yeah. Yeah, no so, problem. Yeah. Okay, here's so, the hole. So you were at so school, you, you draw this, here's you hole. understand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so data, I mean I, I think the so data is like it's the fundamental material of, of current currently how we like how we see the world and how we communicate. It sits between human and machine communication, machine and machine communication and human to humans. It's how we kind of understand the world and ourselves. And it's such, you know, it's so prevalent. I'm particularly interested in natural data. So ideally, my favorite material to work with is real time data from living systems. Anything that is time based and dynamic, I find really fascinating. And, they, you know, there's a lot more of it now than there ever used to be. And so one of the first projects that um, I worked on, which is using this real time data was um, a project called the lake. And from it, I learned that the, even the concept of data has power. So data itself, but even just people thinking that there's data behind something can be really powerful. And this is um, a piece of work called the lake. And it was installed in a, in a lakeside. And it was a digital art piece that tracked 16 fish and used their real time location information to create an immersive sound and animated environment. And what I realized from this project, among, we learned a lot of things, but one of the things was that I'd only tracked 16 fish out of 3000 in this lake. And when the fishermen used to turn up in the morning, they'd come along to this, this is like a nine meter steel cylinder, very resonant space. And you could go into the cylinder and look up and see the digital lake above you. And what I realized was that the fishermen, they were coming, instead of just coming and setting up their fishing tackle, they were coming into the art installation, looking at where the fish were and then setting up their tackle in relation to that. So they were using this piece of work as a sort of map. And I did explain to them that this is just 16 fish out of the whole 3000 and they're really an indicator of where the fish were at any time and yet still they kind of built it into their fishing their daily fishing lives which was really sweet i mean i loved it but i did think it's interesting that the power of just um having this sort of real-time image of where fish are that they wanted to cling to that so an, an another project that i learned um another sort of data fact is about the idea of privacy of interspecies data and how much it matters and this was um, a sort of learning that came out of a project called rat systems rat systems was a project where i tracked um, 24 naked mole rats or 28 because they had four babies uh, naked mole rats in a colony 
in an artificial environment and we tracked their data me and um, the keeper called chris Fawkes, for a, we tracked their data for, for nearly four years got an enormous data set out of it and we looked at their behaviors and how they moved and what they did on a daily basis and it was an important sort of scientific work in the sense that normally these animals are tracked using um, manual observation and the room is 30 degrees centigrade and it's really humid so manual observation is quite difficult so that using the electronic tracking system we managed to get data that nobody else has got on these particular animals and from that data I wanted to to explore using it in different ways so as a straightforward data visualization as an animation as some kinetic um, kinetic sculptures and then one of the one of the um, pieces of research I read while I was doing this was around I was looking at the metadata of animals and something that came up was that with animals um, if you take for photographs say you're on safari and the metadata associated with that picture that gets uploaded to say to one of the social media networks coaches and collectors were using that metadata to locate the animal that you'd just taken a picture of and when I, I was kind of like wow this is kind of the hidden data privacy around flora and fauna and it's not just animals in um in the african continent but it is also rare flora and fauna so it could be an orchid somewhere in indonesia and so what i did was took a series of folk photographs of the portraits of the naked mole rats and then i redacted their eyes so that you could so you wouldn't be able to identify them and it's quite a playful piece of work, but it's fundamentally about the concepts of data and how we need to think beyond human privacy into, into um, the rest of the, the world. And, and this is that I've learned the data, the word data is a very broad brush. I didn't think I learned that, but actually the more I thought about it, the more I witnessed the use of the word data in art forms, the more frustrated I got by trying to understand what what people were meaning when they use the word data. So as part of my PhD and a part of my work at the Open Data Institute, I devised um, a taxonomy for using when you're describing data as an art material. And it's important because if you're, for instance, the lake project, if that wasn't using real time data, if it was using archival data, it would be a very different piece of work. It would mean something different to the fishermen. It would have being something that is almost documentary work as opposed to a live piece and whenever there's for me whenever there's live data in a work it gives it that special kind of frizz on because you know that what you're looking at right there and then is something that is being generated by a living thing so with the data as culture program i was able to use the, the taxonomy in our archive and we worked with nearly 70 artists and there's about 100 works in the archive all of them are tagged with different data types and i think it's important to you know the the context of how you're using data um, what data you're using and where you're using it adds to the artwork and it needs i'd really like to see it described in a slightly better way going forwards and you can have a look at this live on their their website one of the things that this site is particularly good at is providing a snapshot of data artworks and a lot of them are works that you might not think a data artwork. So if you've got, if you've come from a data visualization background, for instance, and you're considering most data art to be very digital or very animated or very kind of high, highly rendered, then this will give you a sort of glimpse of things of people doing many different things. You can see one of them there is like a cardigan, which is a data artwork. And so part of using the taxonomy helps to people to use data in different ways, but it also helps us define whether we are working in the space of data art or whether we're working with data visualization and this is I mean I feel like this is a bit of a bold move in my uh, in my PhD thesis but I wanted to define data art in a way that separated it out so I use this word translations translations of digital data to create cognitive physical and or sublime artworks and for me that definition sums up the sort of malleability of data and how artists can play with it in different ways so that they do put their own voice into it there's a poetic voice that can come through it if you're translating it whereas opposed with data visualization this idea of sort of more direct representation and this it, it, it is it is something that separates it out and i think this definition there's a few of them but from card 
um, and his, uh, their colleagues. This idea that the use of computer-based interactive visual representations of data to amplify cognition is something that is definitely different to using data in an artwork. And one of the ways that this I feel is highlighted is an, another piece of my work called We Need Us. And this piece is, um, it uses data from the Zooniverse. And it's, it's a, a stream of um, real-time, temporal, anonymized, open metadata that is used to generate the dynamics within um, this animated soundscape. And there's 15 compositions based on different um, Zooniverse projects. And Zooniverse is interesting because it's, it's sort of like all about the humanity in the machine. So all of the, the Zooniverse website you can upload, if you're a scientist, upload your data sets and then you ask people to classify them. And a lot of the reason, um, one of the reasons that it's really important is that some of these data sets can't be classified by the machine because the machine learning isn't adept enough at, say, analyzing a, a galaxy spiral. Do that. And I wanted to capture in this artwork that sort of humanity and say that, you know, people are still really important in the system and actually they generate their own data. This is the metadata of the metadata. Um, from the Zooniverse website. And this is like, you can look at this live and live. Something else that I've been thinking about quite a lot, and I love, I love this, uh, I love this idea that data is a numerical opinion. We often associate data as being really objective and really measured. But you know, there's so much subjectivity in anything to do with data. From the very beginning of the process, when you're collecting, what are you collecting and why are you collecting? And all of the privilege and the bias that exists within that kind of like you might be collecting butterfly data, but you do it in a way that can access it. So you do it on your doorstep, which means that the butterflies in another part of the world that don't have access to that technology never get um, data collected and then they don't become important and so on. So at all of these points in the data flow, how do you store who has access? What license do you give it? How do you choose which um, statistical methods to analyze it with? All of that kind of stuff comes from is a um, decision that is made. And when there's so many decisions in the data flow, how can the end result possibly be purely objective? Uh, objective? And it's hard. So I think that you know there there is a whole series of opinions, and this idea that. Um, data is a numerical opinion just helps us kind of remember some of that. And this was definitely inspired by um, Catherine Dignazio. It, I would really recommend just re go into this. It's a single web page, but it, I think about it all the time. And she talks about um, very eloquently about how flawed the, the, the data visualization world can be. And it comes from this idea of like scientific representation also being biased because it, it is like created by someone to, to put a particular message across. And I think it was George Orwell that said, when we invent new things, we have to invent the language to describe those new things. And that's what, what happens within data visualization and data art to an extent, because we're kind of trying to work out how to describe this stuff that we're, that we're harvesting. So then finally, and this is probably for me, one of the most important things at the moment is that I'm learning about data's ecological impact and you know, the amount of waste data and the, the huge amount of data duplication that is around and the amount of energy it takes to, to work with data is something that is really um, pressing. And in the middle of the climate emergency, I feel like if you're working with data, this is something needs to be addressed. And so um, this is a bit of a preview of a project that is launching at the end of September at the V&A in London. And it's called ALICE, Active Living Infrastructure, Controlled Environment. And what the beautiful thing is, is that it, it, it is completely self-powered. So inside the structure are a series of microbial fuel cells that generate power because they use human urine to, um, to feed themselves. And the power that is generated runs a small computer. The computer then has sensors attached and then it tracks the data. And with this kind of closed system, we've created a soundscape and animation and then an overlay of the data visualization to see the fluctuation of energy that the system is creating itself. And for me, this is a really important piece of work because it's looking at this whole kind of cycle of energy 
um, and data and, and translation, and it's all encapsulated in this one piece. So just to sum up all the, the, the things that I feel like I've learned through working with data, and um, I think they're all relevant. I, I'm particularly, as I said, particularly interested in the kind of climate related stuff at the moment. But I think one of the things of working with data is all of these things show that we can learn as we're going along and it is really playful. And I'd like to, to sort of just think about how we can we can use data as an art material and allow it to be malleable and allow it to be playful and we can transform it and translate it and do things with it. But we can also retain some sense of sort of responsibility with that. Um, and it's just, a, yeah, so just going back to the whole for a minute, it's just like, you know, it means many things to different people and that is actually, that is okay. So I'm just gonna leave it there. I have no idea what the, the, the timing is, but, um, I just wanted to give you a quick whistle stop tour of some of the learnings I've had over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you. Very, much. Much. very well in time. So well done us. Um, we're going to move now to um, the discussion part of the session. Um, and Julie, um, I'm going to stay with you for a few more minutes, if I may. Um, so you gave us this amazing overview of the various projects that you, you you've, you've done and the things that you have have learned in your in your career um let me just ask you perhaps something something else which might be um might make sense very little sense at the, at the moment but do you think data makes us more or less creative more or less artistic so what what are your thoughts on that I don't, I, I, you know, I think, I don't know if anything can, can make us be more or less creative in any way. I think for me, I, I'm inspired by data. I mean, and I'm inspired by the, the way it's used and the systems that create it and what we can do with it. And I, I find it absolutely fascinating that, um, that it's become like so pervasive and it's become so protected as well. And I, I think for me, I see, I like, in my world, I see it as this kind of living thing that is uh, that sort of exists inside us. I mean, it's a kind of digital nature in the sense that nature is always ebbing and flowing and the data is always ebbing and flowing. But I think it can be any you can make anything creative. I mean, I don't know, I'm not going to go on about the holes anymore. But for me, that drawing a hole was a super creative process. And everyone else is like, why is she just drawing circles? Um, but I think data can inspire for sure. Um, do you think there is something we, um, as perhaps um, computer scientists and artists, since it's the same thing for you, could do to to um, increase awareness of data as an art material? Um, is there is there something in, that that you and your experience have 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 done or, or, or experience that, that you could share? Yeah, I, I think so partly the taxonomy, uh, being able to describe data as something that is that, that, you know, maybe that's an umbrella term, but actually describing in a, a more granular level, the different types of data and what they can inject into the arc you're making. That's really exciting for me. And I, I would like people to do that more. And also this, this idea of, um, being able to access data so that it's so that you understand how it can be used and where it can be used. So I think you know one of the big blockages is there's a, there's certain types of data that people assume are easy to access. So people are really familiar with large photographic um, data sets, for instance, because of social media, large space data sets. And even to a certain extent, animal biologging, because it's something that we can get our heads around. But there's so many different types of data that are out there. And I think sometimes scientists don't think that it's interesting mm -hmm. because they're looking at something else while they're collecting their data. But to an artist, often there's, there's things that the data can reveal that they maybe hadn't been thinking about because it doesn't fit in with whatever their, their current scientific agenda is. So. Mm -hmm. Um, more, I guess more discussion about data in a sort of open way of like, I've got this stuff, 
what do you think it means you know how mm -hmm. can we play with it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you any concluding thoughts for us to take home any final comments before i will allow some of the other panelists to share their views as well um i don't know i mean my i and i say it all the time but like data is just data isn't truth just just take it you know if we can hold it as a pinch of salt and then it's just one story amongst others that's the that's the key thing i think for me all right thank you very much and thanks again for 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 the talk um we're gonna uh, i'm gonna move to hugo now who's part of obvious a collective of researchers and artists that was set up in in in, in 2018 and um so they are um also working with us in the media future um program on a piece called evil magic mirror um and in general their work explores this augmented creativity uh, space and they use lots of interesting technologies like nfts and deep learning um so i'm very much looking forward to to hear hugo your views about this relationship between data technology and 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 and, and your work and creativity thanks thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation uh, it's a pleasure to uh, take part in this panel so as you say, I'm Hugo, uh, and uh, I'm uh, one of the three members of the Obvious Collective. So we have uh, we are three friends from uh, high school, basically, and we wanted to work uh, together to do something creative for the longest time. And four years uh, four years ago, we decided to uh, to go with uh, artistic creation with uh, AI algorithms. Uh, because basically I'm a, I'm a machine learning researcher. I just got my PhD last June. And, um, and so I've been fascinated by uh, machine learning algorithms uh, since the moment I, I, uh, I saw them. And so basically uh, we gathered around this uh, technical skill at first to ask us some question about artistic creation with this type of algorithms. And uh, we basically uh, uh, ended up creating this uh, artistic collective where we uh, produce uh, artistic series. So we have uh, different type of physical artworks. We mainly do uh, physical artworks because um, one of our core motivation is to uh, talk about machine learning in general and try to uh, get the people to uh, know uh, what is machine learning a bit better and to kind of uh, erase this view that uh, AI is, a, is kind of a numerical cuisine that is going to kill us or something like this. And so we are trying to uh, kind of uh, showcase what uh, machine learning algorithms can be useful for in artistic creation and more generally in the in the, all creative industries. And uh, art is a great medium to communicate messages and that's why we also uh, decided to to artistic creation, it's uh, it was uh, it was kind of obvious for for us to do so, and that's why we are obvious as well. And so, um, uh, as you said, we not only have a physical uh, creation, we also are involved in the in the crypto art scene uh, for for a while now because we were actually invited uh, uh, to the beta version of Super Rare in uh, uh, 2018. So we've been uh, there. Uh, for a while and we are very interested uh, to see how uh, new technologies can help uh, spread uh, new type and new forms of art and that's exactly what we are interested in um, so nfts physical artworks and trying to work with uh, data to do art creation is basically what we do at obvious and uh, and also uh, i can mention that uh, uh, other type of, pro of projects that we have is also to kind of uh, uh, work on uh, other type of creative industries, for instance, fashion or music or uh, architecture and lots of different stuff. And we believe that the algorithms that uh, we use, such as generative adults and networks, clip, uh, stack transfer, etc., uh, can be very useful for this type of uh, creative people. And, uh, and we would like to, uh, them to know about it and to get to use it a little bit more. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you for this. Let me ask you one question. I am uh, totally throwing away my script now, but there you go. Um, say, 
do you think that the um, those models that you're using, so that AI technology, generative networks, you, you, uh, do you consider them to be a material, just like data as a material, or is the AI sort of co-creating the works with you? Uh, so that was like a, a big question that we had at the beginning of our artistic uh, career. And uh, I think we evolved to see that uh, the type of tool that we use, uh, the type of algorithms that we use are tools. And uh, basically you, you can compare this to uh, when uh, cameras appeared in, in, the, in the 19th century. Basically mm -hmm. at first it was like a technological tool and mm -hmm. people started to uh, to use it for artistic creation. And there was lots of uh, criticism that we also have today, such as it's blurry, uh, it's uh, only reserved to high qualified engineers, uh, it's not art, it's going to replace art. And so we usually get uh, those type of criticism as well. And uh, in the end, we can see that uh, photography is now an artistic uh, movement that is uh, uh, widely accepted. And mm -hmm. we believe that uh, it's going to be uh, the same for uh, machine learning algorithms as uh, research uh, progresses and new algorithms are produced every day. Uh, we believe that there is lots of potential and uh, we think that artists are going to uh, take this potential and uh, use it in their creative uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to move on now to music, music uh, composition and, and, and experience. Say so, um, welcome, Dave DeRoor. Uh, Dave is a professor at Oxford, a Turing fellow, a brilliant web scientist. Um, but he's here because of something else, uh, because of his personal research and interest, uh, which sits somewhere between music and, and tech and, 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 and AI. Um, say, Dave, are you an artist or a friend of artists? And following from that, what's your take on data and creativity in music composition and experience? Fantastic. Thank you. And thank, thank you for having me. Gosh, that am I an artist or a computer scientist type question is a great one. You, you, as you say, Julie identifies herself as both. Um, I work with a group at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester called PRISM, practice uh, research in science and music. And we are a mixture of composers, mathematicians, technologists, um, research software engineers. Uh, and But I think we are all involved together in, in the creative process. So I don't want to draw lines between these boundaries. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the... Um, uh, your, 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 your point about um, creativity and just, I think, talk about the AI piece. Um, but first, just to mention that I came into this through algorithmic composition. And when, when I use that term, it sounds as if that's computers generating music. And, and often you could look at it like that. Um, but for the purposes of today's discussions, think of it as listening to algorithms. Because in our discussions now, the algorithms are themselves artifacts that we're interested in. Can you hear algorithmic bias? Okay. There's a, there's a question I'll just leave voting for later discussion. Um, everything I've done over the last few years falls under this banner of sort of numbers into notes. So it fits the theme of this very well. Um, and also notes into numbers into notes, and that's the AI piece. So let's say a little bit more about that. The, the numbers into notes work actually started off um, thanks to Ada Lovelace back in the, you know, the uh, 1843 Ada Lovelace collaborating with Charles Babbage and his um, hypothetical uh, analytical engine um, made a couple of sort of famous quotations, which um, are still you know, widely used today, which are quite relevant to this discussion. So one thing she said was, um, supposing the, the fundamental relations of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and musical composition um, were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. And that phrase, might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent, is one of the things I've explored. Uh, what does she mean by scientific music? And she was a musician. People think of her as a, importantly, as a STEM icon. She, she, she actually had mathematics and, and music competing uh, in it for her attention. Um, that... That uh, sort of sets the scene for algorithmic composition work for numbers into notes. We've, we've um, gone back to the mathematics of the, the 19th century, worked out what, she, what Ada Lovelace might have done. It's very much a creative response. We're not, um, we don't actually know what she would have done. 
the other really important quote for today's discussions is around um is around creativity and she she famously or well, she said many things but one of the things um was that the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything it can do whatever we know how to order it to perform and so on this is very widely discussed it's discussed by Turing. it was discussed by famously by um margaret um bowden in her lovelace questions in the in the ai literature um and and that's sort of sets the scene for the point i want to make which is we've we seem to have got into a world where we're fascinated by can computers do what humans do um and, and this, this world of computational creativity uh and that's evident um also in sort of the public engagement with these discussions people love humans versus machines um science fiction movies <coughs> excuse me sell tickets because it's about humans versus machines they're not, they're not about humans and machines living in, in glorious harmony uh but I, but you know I, I would suggest they they they, they should be so um i think that we've tended to uh, actually ai researchers as well also um seem to love saying can we train this ai on bark or chopin or whatever and then produce something that you can't distinguish from that and we've done some of that and it's great for having discussions with people about about ai and engaging them in discussion about the relationship between maths and algorithms and music much more interesting i think is to treat the ai as a, as a collaborator as a kind of a dis disruptive um creative force and we've done a lot of work in in prism and with a, a phd student uh composer robert laidlow where he's really been composing music with ai about ai uh, and so for example in one piece he trained the ai on his own work prompted it with something it responded he used that as a prompt as a human to to respond again back to the ai and and so on and doing this at different levels of of training um so it's very much a co-creative process yeah. that's the really interesting thing um i'll stop there i'm sure there are other things i can say in answer to your question <laughs> thank you um so so thank you very much on your thoughts also about this idea of co-creation i think yeah. two weeks ago i was in london at the young vic where i experienced a theater play that was created with the help of gpt3 which is a type of um ai system that generates text and the experience was really about this co-creation process between the team that would normally produce a regular play and what that algorithm created and as it happened the algorithm also talked about ai so the play that they created was about ai as well um uh, which give, yeah leads me back to that metadata of the metadata of the metadata as well absolutely what uh, we're talking about um i'm gonna move now to mariana uh, mariana i know that you uh wanted to share um a few slides with us uh, so maybe we try to do that while I do. So Mariana is a performance act, um, artist. Um, she's also a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. What, do, what is with all these people who, we all need to have PhDs for some reason. This is something for us to think about. Um, but um, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam and she's a co-founder of archival consciousness um so mariana thank you for being here tell us more about the project and and your experiences with data and creative settings so we can see a black screen um, I think, yeah, it's, uh, we'll see the the slides as well okay. yes there we go thank you thank you elena um my research is about collective reading infrastructures such as libraries and the book as a technology that is useful to think about reading in digital spaces and to expand the idea of reading a book to reading in larger scales, like reading a database and reading a library. So in practical terms, I'm experimenting with implementing a knowledge graph for multiple cultural libraries as an umbrella to on top of their existing databases, as well as developing a series of uh, micro tools to allow that staff and readers aggregate link data collectively and produce dynamic mapping and, and, and visualizations. Yeah, so these visuals are uh, from the collection of the Apple here in, in, in Amsterdam, for example. So uh, the library and reading are seen as two instances in the process of knowing that can be also replicated to other types of non-commercial environments. It is not about knowledge as an entity, it's about knowing 
as a process, a process carried out by communities in dialogue and dialogues grounded in the belief that ambiguity and uncertainty are important values. I'm quoting uh, Johanna Drucker here. The collections of these libraries are in ruins of um, capitalist exploitation and in danger of extinction. The precarious circumstance offers also a productive environment precisely because they are left intact by not serving the interest of the market. Um, I think that most of the existing AI and machine learning are not useful for the ethos of library. In the library, we don't want recommendation. We want browsing and discovery. Especially because entire digital collections are available only through a search box. Millions of digital items are hidden in plain sight. I like to work in the infrastructure surrounding data. Since software and hardware only put into effect the model structure in their design. Therefore, the creation of digital tools, it must be an intellectual responsibility and not only a technical task. Unless artists and scholars are involved in the making of the digital systems and tools for our future, we are going to live in a future that doesn't work without the methods and materials that we need. Nothing less than a way we understand and know is at stake. Data requires translation, transformation, and interpretation, and in the basis of this process, there are always humans involved. I think we need to stop drawing parallels between computational machines and the human brain, urgently. And when it comes to the development of digital tools, AI and machine learning, um, for, yeah, for AI and machine learning, data is often overlooked in terms of which data are using in training sets. That's why I also find that the, the, the collection of libraries are very interesting and extremely like valuable um, as they have a very rich content, but also because they represent situated bodies of knowledge and specific communities. In my work, I use the collections and also the space of cultural institutions to reenact and to perform algorithms within the context in which this data is produced in order to visualize the whole process in detail, doing sometimes in a year what a computer would do in, in minutes. Um, and I think that is really important, the aspect of, of context and three-dimensionality and the relationship also of our bodies, space, and data. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mariana. Um, may I ask if the collection of books you're showing is curated by you? So do these titles have a meaning specifically to the, to the theme of the talk? <laughs> No, the titles don't have a meaning to the theme of the talk. These are part of a work that I'm doing now also for Media Futures. So that's why I'm showing it. And okay. yes, it is curated by me because, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm prototyping a um, system where um, the visitors will also be able to scan. So what you can see in these books also is that they are the books from the library. You can see that there are the, like, the labels and everything is there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we are also treating them yeah, as, as objects, material objects. So Thank, you. Thank you. And I think that idea that you, uh, that you, um, a uh, message that you had that for some types of, of, of resources like books, um, they're hidden in plain sight, among other things, because of the tools, the digital tools we have to, 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 to access them. Um, would you see a positive, a constructive role for data and technology in, 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 in this? So I appreciate that the search box is, is, is suboptimal to say the least, but do you see perhaps as, as, as Hugo was saying, uh, do, you, do you see technology perhaps as, a, as an opportunity as well and as a tool that one could, could, could use to um, tackle some of these challenges? 
Yes, uh, definitely. And not only these, I think that, yeah, I think that we, we have to, to think in, in many ways also how much it costs to implement technologies or like the sustainability of technologies and queries. And I'm facing this research now with knowledge graphs, of course. But I think that, yes, I think we need to sort of also um, calibrate technology for learning, for research, for knowing, without collecting personal data, you know, like, a, a, a reader wants to know a library. The library doesn't need to know the, the, the reader. And I think that not, not investing in knowing the reader leaves a lot of space for knowing better the collection, you know, and creating relationships and being able to show unexpected things to people and not what a recommendation algorithm would match with you. And, you know, I think that this is, um, it's, it's poor in terms of knowledge. It's very useful in terms of uh, commercial. Um, mm -hmm. For a bookshop yeah. is great, for a library is not really. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think this is an excellent segue, uh, Mariana, to, to our, our um, uh, final panelist. Uh, thank you for this. So I think we can stop sharing now and return to the previous um, view. Um, Say, so, uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to welcome Ellen, who's the founder and CEO of wild.ai. Um, like, all my guests today, she has a fascinating bio uh, with a background in maths and, and, and finances, working as a, as a in hedge fund management for Fortune 500 companies, but she's also a very um, impressive athlete. Um, so I, I've written, actually, I've written a rugby player, ultra marathon runner, three athlete, surfer, skier, ice swimmer. So, Ellen, as an entrepreneur, who was brought up in an arts friendly environment. How do you feel about data and creativity? And perhaps do you feel about data differently in relation to arts than perhaps in a commercial setting? Um, yeah, I think it's actually really interesting. I really enjoyed uh, Julie's presentation because uh, when I was studying maths, I found it, it was, um, was really beautiful. Uh, like I love the, like the pages field of algorithm and uh, it was, yeah, um, like filling pages and thinking it was really, really beautiful. But um, visually, I find it's beautiful. Uh, what we can do with data, I think, is very powerful. Um, and my company is called Wild AI because basically the underlying is if you understand, so we do research on the female body and translate that research into an app helping women eat and train with their female physiology, whether they menstruate, use birth control, are in menopause. Um, and the reason it's called Wild AI is that if you understand the underlying, if you understand rules and how things work, uh, so we do that leveraging on data, you can then go beyond and uh, reach more wilderness. I think, um, yeah, I think using data actually enables us to understand a lot of things. Um, but um, um, but yeah, like the background, like just having grown into my mother is an artist and a lot of my family are like into art collections and, uh, and it's, uh, I think like, yeah, there's, there's beauty in it, but there's also a utility in it. And, um, to, to like the topic of the, of, of the, the panel, which is, um, how did we use data to create what we're doing? Um, for us, it was really um, creating new sets of data that don't actually exist because uh, the world until now, uh, believe it or not, but has considered that women were not that interesting to analyze. So 80% of the medical research is still done on male species. Uh, and it's even worse when it comes to sports, three to 4% of budgets go to women only, whereas the bodies are very different. Uh, like in the best science fiction movies where you create humans or, uh, aliens in a, in a plastic box, uh, women can actually do it today and have been doing it for quite a long time. Uh, and it's pretty hard. So um, yeah, we have a very, very powerful body. And science, literature, religions have made us think very differently. So in religion, seeing that, like think, make, being able to believe, some people believe that the woman comes from the man, it's like it's pretty incredible, like how our marketing has like completely turned stories around. Um, so, so yeah, and, and to the day, uh, research actually hasn't really analyzed women. So for instance, uh, we uh, don't know why women live longer than men, uh, whereas a pretty obvious fact. 
uh, we do not know, we haven't known the, the anatomy of the clitoris until quite recently. Um, we, yeah, there's a lot of things that we don't understand, like, and that's why we use words like women are moody and bitchy and women are complicated uh, because we don't understand the menstrual cycle and what women are going through. So it's easier to just spit on it and think that women are just uh, a crazy uh, type of being versus the norm, which is the man. Um, so what we've done is really uh, like creating data sets that do not exist. So what, what is a normal body variation for a woman? We use trackers, uh, so we track resting heart rate, heart rate variability, body temperature, um, and uh, yeah, and um, and uh, we are able to understand what are the body variations that women are going through uh, through, the, through either her menstrual cycle or through her life, and then understand what are the needs of the body because if you look at the female body when she's menstruating, like a farmland with seasons you can't really throw random crops at random times on the farmland and expect to have good outcomes. And that's really much like we, how we understand the female body today and treat it. So like when, you, when you're menstruating, you need iron. When you ovulate, you need fats. After ovulation, you need proteins. And if you don't respect that, you basically have permanent instabilities. But if you understand that and you can understand the female body better with data, uh, then you can really uh, help women um, reduce negative symptoms and take the most out of the bodies. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we're doing. And, and data is absolutely crucial in what we're doing. And we're really like um, working hard to bridge the gender data gap. Another actually example I'll give you, which is very up to date is, um, it, it, it's not obvious for a lot of people that research doesn't cover women, but um, the COVID vaccine hasn't been really tested on women. And when you take any drug, you can see on the bottle that you that pregnant women cannot use it. The reason is that it's not tested on pregnant women. Um, but it's also not tested on women who take contraceptives, women who are in menopause. And you heard that uh, blood clots are increased risk for women who take a certain type of pill. So what does it mean for other, other drugs? We don't know. So you had this big scandal with AstraZeneca because some people had blood clots, but the risks are much higher if you take a certain type of pill. So it actually means that women are taking drugs and training protocols and nutrition protocols that, are re that can really damage them. Um, and um, when you have a COVID vaccine, uh, uh, you, you don't know whether the effects on your physiology as a woman. So you know that you might have a sore arm, you might have fever, but you don't know that you have, may have late periods, which in your research shows mm -hmm. that more than 10% of women have it, uh, mm -hmm. that you may have early signs of perimenopause, that you may have early periods. Um, and all these things are actual real things. And interestingly, in our world of, uh, of women, these things are not considered as health. So if you have lower back pain, is health. If you mm -hmm. have a late period, it's not health. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's uh, so we are bridging that gender gap. Gender, so, gender so thank gender you, gap. thank you, Ellen. So, so I think this is a very important conversation, in my opinion, as well. So we've spoken a lot um, in the panel about about data uh, with some context um, in relation to some forms of technologies and, 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 and situations in the natural world and, 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 and digital world as well. Um, but I think you bring in a very um, different perspective about data availability, which also is related perhaps to the to the bias discussion we, we, we had. So, so, so thank you all. Uh, for for sharing your 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 views and um, and and answering my my, my questions, um, so we have now I think around six seven minutes for some some concluding thoughts. Um, so I'm going to go back to something that uh, that Dave was saying about can we hear algorithmic bias? Um, so um, sonification that's something that that. That Julie, you, you also worked on. You mentioned your project on Zooniverse. Any views from from the panel on whether we can hear algorithmic bias and whether we should rely on this sort of uh, media to to increase perhaps public awareness on that? Anyone? Raise your hands, like literally. Yes, Julie, please. I was hoping you would. <laughs> I think that it, um, listening, I think listening to like 
data sonification in the sense that it's kind of like a use, usefully to hear the sort of glitches maybe our ears are really good at detecting patterns much more quickly than we are with our eyes, I think. And there's a there's an art project by um, some artists called Semiconductor who worked with solar storm data. And it's an um, I mean, it's such a magical piece of work. And that came from one of the scientists who was um, he had loads of solar storm data, obviously over the a time, massive time period. And he used to just he son wrote a script to sonify it and he just used to have it listen, listen to it in his office. Mm -hmm. And then when there was some kind of unusual disturbance he'd he'd pick it up but it was kind of like an ambient way of scanning the data using his um mm -hmm. using his ears so it didn't you know didn't impact the, his day it just sat in the background mm -hmm. but i think our, it would be interesting to see whether the bias could be detected because we were all listening with our own biases so i mean sure. you're the and also the way that you write the sonification, the bits that you pick out, what frequencies you're going to convert into whatever sound, all of that stuff needs to be, um, it all comes from somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, so last, was it last week? Yes, last week I was in this, uh, in a workshop um, called The Audible Universe with a bunch of astronomers and and sonification people and i was sort of like the the satellite they called me uh, which i think they meant an outlier um <laughs> but but um practically there was there was a very strong um theme there around accessibility around for, for sonification which which also made me think about digital divide more widely and 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 um, ways. I mean, we talk a lot about technology and implications and biases, but, but um, I don't know how accessible these conversations are uh, to general public um, and also to, to to various various types of of, of, of audiences. Um, let me let me ask something else, something very different. So so we all know about some digital companies that collect and hold most of the data and most of our data what do you think should be their roles in um in data artworks and creative works of data anyone yes mariana <laughs> yeah i i think that what we really need is uh, contemporary speculative theory and uh, experiments that are outside of the rigid Silicon Valley model. I don't think we should rely too much on the big tech to support creative industries, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's a subliminal way to perpetuate like the same power structures and ideologies. And they don't allow for criticality and openness enough in their process. And although there is no doubt that they do develop valuable technologies and, and application, I, I think they should be collectivized actually. Hmm. Perhaps the subject of a different panel. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> looking forward to that um final question for me so, so 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 when we rely too much on data so so if you if you those of you who have might remember chris anderson from of ted talks and and wired he said if there is enough data you don't need anything else you don't need any descriptions you don't need any theories um how do we feel about about that in creation processes and 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 otherwise? Yes, you go. Uh, yeah, so I will talk about uh, our artistic process, but I would say that uh, it definitely shows uh, in our work that uh, we cannot do anything. Uh, we can do everything with data, and that most of our uh, work that we are most proud of are collaboration with uh, people that do not work with data. So for instance, to create physical pieces, so we would uh, create an artwork and then uh, 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 collaborate on the production with uh, people that have traditional uh, craftsmanship knowledge. And I think uh, this is the type of stuff that is uh, irreplaceable and that uh, also many people are getting more and more interested in this type mm -hmm. of uh, of, uh, of skills that are really hard to learn and uh, and so we definitely uh, need uh, uh, many other things that uh, only data and uh, data is just yeah a tool and a material that we can use but uh, we definitely 
need to look away from our computers uh, from time to time, I think, yeah. Absolutely. And in, in, in that sense, I think uh, this is almost a prompter for me to tell you to look elsewhere rather than at the screen, because uh, we are nearing the end of the session on creating with data. So let me thank everyone, Julie, Dave, Hugo, Ellen, Mariana, for joining me here today. Um, so with this session, we conclude the Data Arts and Creativity Program at the start day which I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Um, and now I'd like to invite everyone to go back to uh, the uh, main stage, uh, something called Circus des Wissens, which I think means the knowledge circus. Um, and to Lucas, who's our host throughout the whole uh, days of, of, of starts, uh, he's gonna wrap up the morning and he's gonna give you a preview of what's next in the afternoon. So thank you to everyone, uh, to the panelists and to everyone who joined us in the audience and I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a very brief wrap-up um, of this morning session, however we're in the afternoon, of the Starts Day. I want to thank uh, Elena Simpel um, for this great panel with great guests. And uh, there's, there's two interesting takeaways of the morning session, uh, the earlier session with uh, Territorial Agency and the other project, and the session by, uh, moderated by Elena. It's very interesting to, to understand that on one side there is a lot of data, and on the other side there is a, a type of craving for very typical other sorts of data. Uh, I'm, I'm advertising uh, uh, also a workshop we will be hosting in Amsterdam also supported by the European Commission uh, under Arts Formation, which is a workshop about um, feminist data sets by Carolyn Sinders, uh, who clearly sees that there is this lack of that type of data sets. So uh, please check that on the VAX website in the Arts Formation uh, project, the Feminist Data Visualization Workshop, 23rd of September. Um, the other thing uh, um, about understanding how much data there is, but also how much other data sets you can still create. Um, going back to what was discussed this morning, it's interesting to see um, that there is uh, some skepsis about how to take this type of knowledge, knowledge creation by uh, those artists uh, to the heart of the political arena. I thought it's interesting uh, uh, to see those visualizations of uh, geocinema and uh, a territorial agency. And if this is so much supported or um, by the Starts Prize of the European Commission, it will be also taken to Brussels to be shown at the Beaux-Arts Museum there. And let's see whether we can bring it closer to Parliament or even in it. Uh, if, you, if you understand this, this idea of, of the fact that politics is often about words and not about images. So, that would be uh, uh, my little takeaway. I learned much, much more. I thought it was a very rich uh, uh, morning session, but we got a wrap because uh, we go out for a late lunch. Um, Christina and uh, Carla of Ars Electronica are now giving uh, a tour of the Starts Prize winners uh, somewhere else here on the uh, Kepler University campus. But there is more uh, that we have for you in the afternoon. Um, there is um, a partner channel, um, uh, yeah, uh, on the partner channel, yeah, uh, through the Ars Electronica website and on Swapcard. You can uh, go and join two other projects. Robots are people too, uh, of the Voyex project, which is also one of the other starts projects about robotics, understanding that robotics need help from humans to, to become better. Uh, and the other one is the, the art and technology uh, architecture panel by the Mindspaces Lighthouse project, which is also starts um, funded. For the afternoon session here, um, I want to invite you back at uh, 3 o'clock, where I will have a conversation with um, the two makers of Remix El Barrio, the other Starts Prize winning project, that's Marion Rial and Anastasia uh, P. 
Pisto Fidu. And uh, thereafter, after my conversation with them, we will uh, go even in a deeper dive, the fabrication deep dive, on the future of sustainable manufacturing, with a keynote of Michaela Magas, who I will then uh, um, introduce more in depth uh, to you, uh, initiator of the uh, Industry Commons Foundation. With uh, inputs of the makers of uh, uh, Remix El Barrio and Areti uh, Markupulu. Thereafter, there is another um, uh, panel called Make in Your City about new value chain for fashion, created or curated by the Refreen team uh, and moderated by Christine uh, Lubele Bear. So, um, there's one last thing, and that's the uh, Start community, the online networking moment with uh, Hakan Libdo, and that starts at 7. There you have the ability to uh, talk to many of the artists that were nominated or got awarded the Starts Prize. So, uh, that's it for this morning session. Uh, I, um, uh, I welcome you back at 3 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good.